The more legal ident identification you have, believe me, the more problems you're going to have. Jurisdiction is the problem, not the definitions of the words. How about I just figure out what I am and just stop caring about what they are? It's just you got to understand who, who you are and then all the, all the nonsense, the layers and layers and layers and layers and layers of deception they put over top of everything just, just go away at that point. We were talking about capacity and stuff like that when we were having uh, lunch there. And that, that's something else, like when you're getting more philosophical about this stuff and this idea, I think that's one of the things people have to realize is really there actually is no way to positively identify what you are. It's impossible, right? You actually cannot factually describe yourself because what makes up you, you can't describe, right? It's beyond that. That's why, well, he, he knows us. Only our creator knows us because he made us. He knows exactly what we are. We can't comprehend what we are. Um, beyond that, even though we say know who you are, I think people know what we mean, what we mean when we say that. Because um, that's, I mean, for 10 years now people have been saying that, you know, don't you know who you are yet? And uh, th that's impossible, that'll never happen. You might know when you die one day. But the most important thing is, is I don't know what I am precisely and as a whole, but I do know what I'm not. That's the most important part here. So. Outside of this box, it doesn't matter what I am. Because I know what I'm not, and it's not that. So that's why when people want to go into court and they say, well, I can't be that because I'm this. That's actually, I want to turn that around now and say, well, it doesn't matter what I am. What does it matter what I am? Except that I'm not that. After that, it's irrelevant, that's private. That's the public and the private, okay? You can go out and you can do commerce all you want. You can have a store. You can operate, if you want to call it, publicly without a license and make money, generate revenue. I don't care about the words again. Like when people are say, oh, you have to call it traveling if you want to do it to make it a right. I don't know. I don't. I don't have to call it anything. I call it me going over there, driving. I don't care what the word is because when it's over here, it's something I can do anyways. It doesn't matter what I call it. Oh, if you call it driving, then it's commercial and the government can tax all commerce anywhere in this universe. Therefore, you're going to owe them taxes if you do that, just by calling it driving. Like, no, what nonsense, right? It's absolute nonsense. That's why all these things have to go through a smell check whenever I, when someone brings me a new theory, right? I do a smell check for, for is it just ridiculous? Does it fit the, uh, I always take things from one extreme and then to the other extreme and say, so is it possible for that to be true? Because it would have to be true on both extremes. No matter how extreme the situation got, it still has to be true when someone brings a theory or a definition or something. And that's, that's one of the smell checks. So if it doesn't smell right, then it's definitely not the case. Um, and that's just common sense. That's natural law. Does that make sense? Does it really make sense? Yeah. Right? Like the government passes a, a law and says they can tax commerce. So, uh, you know, do, do you see Martians showing up, dropping off a chest of gold for the government once a year? No. That's what I mean by smell checks. I like to take things to their absolute most ridiculousness. Okay, they passed a law in some room over there in Ottawa. So now the universe must offer up to Caesar what a Caesar is, right? Like, come on. They can clearly only have authority over their own business. And what's your business is your business. And what's my business is my business. And that's another one of the reasons why I think, uh, especially 13 years ago or whatever, I've still never heard from CRA. Part of that was probably luck. I'm glad they didn't show up about eight years ago. Now I'd be a lot more comfortable, clearly. But uh, one of the last meetings I think I had uh, personally with a, a CRA agent, when uh, that was the last one I had at their building before they sent a specialist out to my house to speak to me. And then that was the last time I ever heard from him ever again. Um, but when I was in there, and they're always asking those questions, you know, well, what, uh, well, what do you do for a living? What's your income? Uh, what are you employed as? Like, what's your trade? All those stupid questions. And I was just getting, I'm just like, what? I'm like, you're getting angry with that stuff. And I didn't know any of this stuff back then. You're thinking to yourself, what right does this person have to ask me that stuff? And so that's why we always get mad and everything. But I just finally said, oh, I said, what's my trade? Well, I'm into, uh, I'm in the business of NOIFB. <laughs> And she goes, oh, what's that? I said, well, it's my business. It's NOIFB. And she goes, what's NOIFB? I said, it's none of your 
business. <laughs> That's what my business is. And she's like, oh, well, I can see this is not going to go anywhere. <laughs> you know, gets up and leaves. Okay. But it's true. That is actually the most accurate statement you can make. It is my business. If it was your business, you would know what it is. If you don't know, that's because you're not a party to it. It's got nothing to do with you. Therefore, it's my business. Where do you work? Well, if, it, if, if, that, if you were privy to that, if, you, if we had any type of a business relationship, you would know where I work. Clearly, because I'd be working for you, because that's the only thing you have jurisdiction over. So if you don't know that I work for you, then I clearly don't. Beyond that, who cares? Then tell them to go get a real job. They don't like that either if you want to get mouthy. What do you do for a living? Something productive, unlike what you people do. <laughs> so, um, yeah, exactly. Uh, boy, I don't know. Uh, what do you guys want to talk about, I guess, then, going back to... It's, it seems to me quite important to, to establish the right jurisdiction in any court matters. If we are going in as a defendant from some action they initiated, we need to get this common law of court going to counter their stuff. But if we have served them with the three strikes are out, and we are going in as plaintiff to take them to court, we need to come in in the right jurisdiction. Absolutely. Could you address how we can pull that off? Because that seems to be the key. Yeah. And very few people have been successful except you and a few others, and that's it. Well, I don't know how sex successful I've been yet with that, other than the fact they just, they, they kind of want, like, I actually don't get into any of this, especially that last time I went to jail kind of thing. I just like to argue and, I don't know, get in, you know, shouting matches with them in the courtrooms and stuff like that, but, because uh, I was actually waiting until I got out. To, to, to really start doing all this kind of stuff. And uh, we've only actually, I, I did uh, one amend, uh, amended statement of claim for a friend who was a plaintiff against the government. Um, the guy I talk about in the videos that uh, was pulled over with uh, you know private plate, no driver's license, um, full camo, hunting knife, rifles and shotguns on the back seat, everything, you know, when they pulled in, they're just like, whoa, what the, you know, where is this guy from? And they didn't know what to do with them, kind of thing. And that's so I made up a, an amended statement of claim that clarified everything that I realized was deficient in our previous attempts at lawsuits and left nothing out of the equation now. There's, it, was, it was nailed right down, like we came in from the proper, let them know right at the top, this is the jurisdiction the guy was in at the time of the complaint when the cop, when the cop stopped him. They can't prove otherwise. Here's all our letters, here's this, here's the fee schedule, blah, 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 pleadings all the way down. And you always have to have pr provide proof of your claims, evidence, right? So an affidavit is not enough, an evidence. So you want to have the, the copy of the statement of claim in there. Uh, in your pleadings, if, you're, if your pleading says you're coming in from, uh, say, inherent jurisdiction, and that's what sets the jurisdiction of the court, then a good piece of evidence to attach that would be C Exhibit A. And then put a certified copy of the live birth record at the back for your first exhibit. That's going to be a little tough for the Crown to get around if they're the defendant. They're going to have to provide a fact or evidence that counters that, rebuts it, provides lawful excuse for what they did, something. And that's not going to happen at all. So you've already got them right there. And I think that's why the hearing, the first hearing you had when that amendment statement of claim was put in, that's why the judge was all smiles. And it was just kind of like, hmm, okay. And happy someone's finally doing this against the province, I think, because they were shitting when they read the amended statement of claim, just going, oh, we're, we're hooped. Like, we are seriously screwed here. We can't do anything about this. And they weren't the cocky, arrogant people that they were the last six hearings. So it definitely, definitely got a reaction, a very positive one in our favor. Um, I don't know if you have an outline for what you want to do here, so my question might be... Not really. Not really? Okay. No outline. Right. I'll ask it then, because you, you've done pleadings and you've put in evidence. One of the common things I run into, and I mean, I have trouble with myself to some degree still, but people who I talk to often I find that there's this lack of clarity on what's evidence, what's legal argument, and pleadings have to contain both, but they have to be set up properly too. Yes. I mean, you know that when you plead the facts, that's sufficient to uh, allow a crime to be evident from those facts, but pleading law doesn't work. So maybe if you know some things about pleadings, maybe you could give us a bit of an outline on that. As far as I'm concerned, the only real purpose of the pleadings is to give a simple, uh, in, in the least amount of words possible, you want to let the judge know what happened. 
And that's all your pleadings are, as great as they're in affidavit form. So you're just running through the events of, uh, you want to properly establish what the business relationship is with the individual that you're, that you're suing. And that means, if that's a rights violation, I mean, that starts right from, right from the moment, moment of contact, right through when the injury happened, to everything that happened afterwards when you contacted them and you tried to settle the matter and they ignored you. You just want to, just very point form, get that out in your pleadings. And then after you're done that, um, I mean, the, the way we're doing it, and I mean, I, honestly, I'm by no means an expert when it comes to pleadings and, and lawsuits, but I just know that the ones that we're doing, uh, now that we've got this thing down a little better, we can write some much better ones, and I fully intend on it, which is why I've waited to do a lot of this stuff. So, the, and that's it. So, um, and again, a lot of people, and I still don't obviously know uh, everything there is noble court, in fact, far from it. But I do know, I, I understand, and people don't realize the jurisdictional issues in the courts, and, they, and um, that's what I was trying to establish here, because people think that provincial court is the same as like, like the civil side. You know, like, oh, it's, it's all court, and it's all happens in courtrooms, right? But they're all c for completely different purposes, completely different jurisdictions. Um, I think that's where I was going with that. So in the pleadings, establish the jurisdiction. That sets the tone. Like, again, I said that earlier. The judge will hear whatever evidence you bring in, whatever law you bring in. But you have to bring it. You can't put a pleading in that talks about violations of human rights or whatever, and he goes, oh, well, you must be talking about inherent jurisdiction. Uh, oh, could you please send, please, uh, please give me a copy of your live birth record? Like he's not going to, you know, you've got to give him everything. And he can only make decisions based on what you give him. And that's why you want to lock down the crown in advance long before, uh, I mean, Winston Schrote says that. Uh, he's never been more right about, about anything when he says it, you don't go to court till you've already won. That's just the formal hearing to say, um, <laughs> Yeah, do um, you have an explanation for this? you have a lawful excuse for anything you did? They don't. They, they, you've already won before you went there. Because the pleadings and the evidence that you've attached to the file have already demonstrated everything, including the fact that they never replied everything. You're just there to get your check for the most part. It's done. <clears throat> what lawyers do is the opposite of that. They make everything as convoluted as possible, and they leave everything to the judge to make decisions on. Everything. It's all open to the interpretation of the judge. We're doing the exact opposite of that. That's why they want us to use lawyers. We're establishing everything in advance, locking it down, leaving nothing to his interpretation. It's a decision based on, well, yeah, okay, blah, 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 okay, yeah. That's all it is. Right? So, uh, but then the pleadings, uh, I'll just I'll say a couple more things about that. The, other, the things you want to establish in the pleadings, aside from the facts, are the damage and the remedy being sought. Where is the damage? That's very important. So it's a, it's a statement of facts, and that the only reason you want the exhibits is to support as much as the, the claims you're making as possible. There's no such thing as too much. Facts, 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 or uh, exhibits, because th that's what helps you establish facts, right? Again, there's, there's only evidence of something. You can never prove something for an absolute fact, but you can demonstrate and give evidence that something has occurred. So your pleadings should demonstrate all that and try to be as precise as possible. But don't ramble and don't have, oh my god, I've seen ones with a half a page, um, like line item number nine just was a, a meaningless rant. It's like, what, what is this? You actually think a judge is just going to want to see that? No, they just lead him through the events. And again, as clear and precisely as possible and to the point. So once you're doing this, so those are the three main components, and then you can start adding all sorts of stuff in there. So you're going to have you're going to have your pleadings, which which set out what happened, and then you're going to have the damage that was caused by those actions and the remedy being sought. That's the three most important parts, and you start adding from there. And you can uh, after after the plain statement of facts and the damages, uh, then you can start adding uh, things like uh, proof proof of claim, and you can attach other affidavits and other proofs in there. Um, bring in uh, bring in new pieces of evidence as exhibits, exhibit this, exhibit that, except try to list all your exhibits when you actually say um, this was done and then see exhibit A, right, and then have the exhibit A on the back so it's all kind of correlated. You're like, um, you're, you're making a TV show for the, for the judge 
and you want to, when he sits down and watches the TV show for 25 minutes, you want him to have a complete picture of everything that happened. You have to give him that. So that's where you got to lead him down through all that. And then you can go on to laws being relied upon, like if you've been damaged and you had a fee schedule, and you can prove that they received it, you know, the registered mail receipts, everything, um, so that you can justify the amount of money you're asking for. Where can I justify it? Law be I call I say law being relied upon, and then I continue on with the numbers, right? So I, my plain statement of facts are like thirty something points long, and then laws being relied upon. It's just like a header, like a subheader, and then point thirty six. So you keep them all numbered in sequentially. You don't go right back to one because you're in a new section, and that way you can always refer to you know refer to line seventy whatever you know, and everybody's on the same page when you're talking to the judge at a hearing and whatnot. Um, but you better believe your fee schedule is a lot of your life upon. Did they get it? Were they given notice of how much it's going to cost them if they mess it over here? Yes. That's a, and my fee schedule always has uh, in there that they're welcome to negotiate these prices with me. You know, it's clear we're probably going to have some run-ins out there in commerce. It's bound to happen. Do you guys want to negotiate these these fees a little bit if you think they're too uh, they're too steep, they're a little egregious? No, they never reply. Okay, well, they're good with it. They never replied. Strictly the default. They got it. Postmaster General says they got it. He's my witness. Right? So that's one of the laws being relied upon. And then the only other laws now, um, especially for criminal stuff, uh, and even for civil, that I would want to bring in is those two pieces of case law that a friend sent me that backs up everything I've ever said about sections 52 and 32 of the uh, Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Uh, because not only does that clearly tell us what the government can't do, but that proves your civil claim as well. So as soon as they trespass in your life and meddle in your private affairs, that case law said, yeah, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms right here, and these decisions say the government can't get involved in my life, they can't meddle in my private affairs. And if they do, they've damaged me. So you want to get stuff like that into a civil claim, because again, the judge can't see it if you didn't provide it. Just because you say, well, the, prob the problems pulled me over and harmed me, they can't do that. Do you think he's going to say, oh, yeah, yeah, I've read in the charter where it says that, right? No, it doesn't exist unless you have brought it in. It does not exist. You have to bring everything you need in your case. So the concept that um, um, the court has uh, uh, <coughs> judicial notice of things like charter is not really relevant. You have to bring it in. Because the judges have said to me, well, if you take judicial notice of that, so there's no, there's no need to bring it in. So this is just his opinion. Was that in, was that in a, like, a statutory court? Yeah. Yeah, of course. Okay. He doesn't want you to bring that in. Okay. Of course they take notice of it. Uh, but what, so why are you bringing it in, though? Right? Well, in a particular case, so the reason to bring it in. But he mm -hmm. said you don't need to do that because the court takes judicial notice of that. Which means you it's before them already. You don't, don't, they're they're you bound. Don't, you don't need to bring the documentation in to take notice that it exists and they're aware of it. Yes. And it's part of their decision making process. But you don't need to provide the documents. Yeah. But if it was really part of their decision making process, would they ever be able to prosecute you? No. Because it's all outside. They take notice of it. Uh, but he's not the prosecutor. He's not supposed to be acting as the prosecutor. That's what I mean, exactly. And, and so, it's when they act as the prosecutor instead of the judge that's the problem. Yeah, and they do that. But that's why don't even get into these verbal things with the judge in there. If you just get your your your, your claim together, get your entire motion together, and put that all in there, and just hand that in after you're done, after the crown's already agreed with you for, with everything, and you get your motion to motion to discharge. Uh, all, all you have to do is walk in and say, um, yeah, judge, um, did you read my motion? Did you read the entire document? Uh, well, well, no. Well, then I suggest we recess for 15 minutes so you can, so you can read it and make sure you understand it. If you want another 15 minutes to, to, to make sure you understand it, I'm okay with that. I'm not going anywhere anyways. Right? He's going to have read it. And all you have to do then just follow it up with one thing. To say, did you like, did you read it? Yes. Did you understand it? He's going to say yes. If he says no, I didn't understand it. Say, what part did you not understand? So I can explain it to you then. Right? It's 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 in pretty pretty plain jargon. I have a little trouble believing that you don't understand such plain English language if that's what you're saying.
But then you just say, okay, well, if you've read it and you understand it, there's a motion before the court. If you're going to refuse, if you're going to refuse the motion, on what grounds? They have to have grounds for what they're doing. And the grounds can only come from your adversary, the Crown. <coughs> what facts and evidence has the Crown provided that would give you grounds to not grant my motion? Or are you making a personal decision with no facts and evidence provided by who's accusing me? It's very bad for him if you're going to come after him civilly afterwards. Lock him in with stuff like that. Again, all stuff I do not do in court myself. So with your previous statement about trying to keep the inherent jurisdiction under control, these pleadings should not bring in too much statutory stuff. No, no statutory stuff. Except for the Charter. <laughs> That's not statutory. That's not a statute of Canada. That's correct. It's a statute of the UK. That's why you never need to go below that document, ever. That's why people say, well, yeah, but, but in this definition within this act, I say stop right there. I don't give a shit about that definition in that act. It means nothing to me because it's below this waterline. And the waterline is the charter that tells the government what they cannot do to you. The only person who argues the statute is the statute of That pretty much proves their jurisdiction, doesn't it? You're just helping them by doing that. That's why it's beautiful. So keep it simple, stupid. K-I-S-S. -S. Mm -hmm. Agreed. If you only have to bring up two pieces of the most well-known document in Canada, why would you want to dig into um, page 8,000 of some act to pull up something obscure to, to, to try to, uh, to defend yourself or, or to go after your, your accuser? Gotcha. Yeah. That's it, just, so just keep it to that. Bill of Rights is a lot like the Charter Bill, isn't it? I mean, word for word, except for... Yeah, except it actually is uh, a, a legislative act, or a parliamentary, whatever you want to call it. It's a statute created by the government. So it is protections afforded to stuff the government has jurisdiction over. You could probably bring you could probably bring that into if you want the Bill of Rights as well. I don't think it's necessary to bring so in the Bill the of Rights. Rights. For, for yeah. our purposes, has quite a bit more clothes. I, I already know what my rights are. My rights are I can do anything I want if I don't cause any harm. Until I cause harm. Those are my rights. If somebody's damaged me and I can prove the damages, then I take it to civil court. I don't need to prove. Well, this document right here says I can, you know. I'm probably not that I could explain that better, but I, I didn't. That's okay. I think you kind of get the point of that. There's no reason to go to the Bill of Rights. Okay. So you can use um, case law, but not statutes. Is that what you're saying? I wouldn't even use case law based on statutes. No, there's, there's like, again, that's why I love these, these two decisions by the Supreme Court of Canada. And that's another thing everybody has to understand, too, is the judges in civil matters, uh, or let's just say judges, period. I don't want to get too specific. They can hear law that is non-statutory, clearly. Stuff that's far above statutory authority, which is interesting that a judge, that, that tells me right away, I don't think they're appointed by, by the legislature. I'm really not sure how that all works. But uh, the courts were created by a legislative act, but the judges can hear laws that exist way outside of the jurisdiction of the government that created them, which is interesting. So it's got it's got me thinking, in, in my belief, in my mind, that the judges are actually the the measure that they clearly have oaths that, essentially, if you bring inherent law or common law into the courtroom, they have to be of a capacity to hear. Which means, at some point, that judge is literally acting as Her Majesty Elizabeth Regina on the bench, Her Majesty because she's the defender of the common law. Okay, I've heard all these arguments, well, it wasn't a proper oath, uh, it wasn't on the proper stone, the proper stone is, uh, is uh, you know, seven pounds, and uh, the one that she was sitting on was 7.5, it's been a forgery since 1411, or some crap I don't care about. <coughs> she has an oath to protect me, great, that sounds good, that's a good offer, I like that, why would I want to say she's not legitimate? Especially if she's my ally, that's not something I would want to accuse a friend of. I'm her friend, and according to them, she's got some pretty serious power, and I've got equal standing to her, and she's supposed to protect me because she's holding... And again, I get into arguments with this with people. Sorry, I don't get into arguments 
they start rebutting me and telling me how things are. Okay. When I get this document back from the government, except you have them now, so it's okay. Sorry. <laughs> no, it doesn't matter. Live birth record is stamped by the province. It says it was issued by the province. Okay. After that, I don't care who has the document. People are like, well, did you really know that it's held in this, the, in this bank account in this foreign country by the DTC and it's being used by blah, blah, blah and all this crap and everything else? And I'm like, I don't care. I can't prove that. And what difference does it make even if it is true? It's stamped by the province. Until they provide evidence otherwise, they're the trustee of that document. What they've done with it, I don't care. It proves nothing and it means nothing. But that ultimately means that, in, as far as I'm concerned, um, because they're all, uh, I don't want to phrase this improperly, clearly Canada was chartered by the UK. And clearly Queen Elizabeth is the reigning monarch. She's no longer rules, she reigns. And that means that she has all the authority um, regarding what she's holding in trust. That has the effect of her holding your document in trust. She's been entrusted with all the property to protect it for us, protect our rights. If you want to call that her holding all legal title to all this stuff, great, that's fine. I'm good with that. Because that creates, that's evidence of a trust. <coughs> and that's what I want in court. I want evidence of a trust. That's great. Now, a couple of bandits can't come by my, my house and just kick me out and take my house and say, that's our house now. No, no, no. She's entrusted with all the legal title to everything. And I can show you on the record that this house belongs to me. That's why it's important. Why are we trying to get away from, oh, I want to deregister my property. I want it to not exist at all. Are you kidding? What the hell for? Yeah, how is that a good thing? It's not a good thing at all. In fact, if somebody did convince me that they actually completely deregistered their property and their property did not exist according to the government anymore, I'd go there and take it from them. Say, good. You can't prove you own the property, so I guess I do now. Now, what's my claim of right? I'm bigger than you, and I'm going to kick the shit out of you. That's why property registration is a good thing, and the record's being kept to protect our rights. So, uh, as long as they're actually doing what they're supposed to do. <laughs> and now, obviously, that kind of gets us into the fact that with this little scam they're playing, which really isn't really a scam, it's more our own, our own ignorance, we did it all to ourselves, they're abusing the fact that they know what's going on behind the scenes. And they're committing abuses of executive power because they have the executive power to alter records. But they're only supposed to do it by due process of law. Is there due process of law being done when they charge you property taxes, don't prove it, you don't have a court date, and they simply attach it to your property and then sell it in a tax sale when they're supposed to be the trustees of it? Holy <coughs> shit, are you kidding me? Wow, you want to talk a civil claim? Let's take that into court. That's why as soon as I started even bringing up little things like this to, uh, to one of the lawyers for the city of Winnipeg, they backed off immediately. Immediately. They know they can't prove anything. They just kept coming after other properties I own. So, but I'm going to get around to all this now. I was kind of waiting on the last few pieces, which filled in about three months ago for me. And by then I was a little bit busy. And then I had an 18-day hiatus from life. And... Uh, <laughs> got back out to even more stuff to clear up and now I've got some really big lawsuits I want to go ahead and I would expect I'm going to have to find a new form of staple <laughs> to staple that whole sucker together by the time I take it down there. Yeah, she used to rule and now she reigns. The political, the political power is removed from her, it's now yes. in the hands of parliament. So even she, though she's still ultimately in control of the parliament, right. yes. Right. So she has no political influence? Yes. And she's supposed to be the one that they are accountable to yes. for their actions. Exactly. Another trust relationship. Yeah. Well, she's, she's entrusted them with doing what she's supposed to do. Yes. And she still monitors them. And she's not supposed to interfere in the political process. Yes. But she's supposed to ensure that they obey the law. Yeah. What, what happens in the pro world when uh, whatever was going on with the Prime Minister, you couldn't deal with it. I don't even know what it was, but they brought in the, uh, what was it, the uh, Governor General, who was an acting liaison for the Queen. And then Alex Jones was talking about it and said, yeah. the duplication of what happened in Australia in 1980 something that showed that basically the, the uh, silk love came off the iron fist and that the Queen 
literary rules in every way over both in you know, over Canada and across the world. Yeah, everything's done technically. Uh, I think that was because the government had fallen yeah. in a vote, so there was no power from part of the left. But, if you should, but he was saying that it showed that they actually have the authority. Oh, I, I, can, I can prove that right now. Yeah. Okay, all you have to do is read, uh, read into a statute. Uh, which one is it? Hang on here. Um, actually, it's in their SEC filings too, the Securities Exchange Commission filings, that they even talk about how uh, Canada is a uh, uh, blah 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 whatever created by the BNA Act of 1867. That's in last year's SEC filings. So they try to say the BNA is not relevant anymore. Yeah. Well, just read your own friggin' document, anyways. Um, the, the, the head of the party that wins the most votes is invited by the lieutenant governor to become the leader of uh, of the whatever the, the the government that's that's running at the time he's invited that means that when we allegedly when we vote one of these guys in that just means okay this is who they want so now we'll invite him to be yeah. so we actually don't put him in power they put him in power we just tell them who we want in power that tells them they can dissolve the legislature at any time and in fact that was the thing there that uh, a couple of years you're talking about where Harper had to go to the governor general mm -hmm. to request that he dissolve parliament. He needs permission from the governor general to do that. Parole parliament. What was it? Parole. Yeah, yeah whatever it was called. Parole. It well, yeah, not wasn't dissolved, it was the, the other thing. Yeah. But he does have the power to dissolve it yeah. oh, outright. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that, that tells you clearly where the, where the, where the power is. <laughs> Yeah. So in the Queen, same thing. The Queen can just dissolve Parliament in, in the UK and just take the powers back. Can you go before the court, like if you have a tax issue, like I, I did the, you know, the accepted for whatever it was, and, and it actually worked for me, my tax thing, it, went, it all worked. It works hit and miss for some people. Yeah, it worked for me and a bunch of other people I was involved with all of too, but um, Queen Victoria, I think 1890-something, actually made a proclamation on the country in Ottawa that no Canadian would ever, as a royal decree of the country, would ever pay tax on their neighbor. I'm just wondering if you can bring that before the court, I guess it could be you. Well, she's right. <coughs> of course she's right. Yeah. What title are we talking about here? Which can, what, what does she mean but by you, Canadian? You can, you can remind them of that their statement, right? Yeah, you don't even need to. Yeah. Yeah. Again, it comes down to jurisdiction. What gives them the authority to tax you? Yeah. You. When you're operating through your title and inherit jurisdiction, they don't because your business is none of their business. You don't even need a proclamation from the yeah. Queen to arrive at that conclusion, right? And it relies on you making that claim. They're not giving it to you, you have to make a claim. Exactly. And we've accepted everything so far. And then we get pissed off. Like I said, they mailed it to us, told us not to use his ID, and then we did. It's our own fault. It's not them. They're not. Uh, they're not supposed to teach us our rights. They're not supposed to teach us trust law. They're not supposed to teach us all this stuff. That makes that make them a very bad business, wouldn't it? Again, here's a contract. But I'm warning you, you are going to get royally screwed in this. It's a really bad one. You'd have to be insane to sign this. Just sign the dotted line. They're not going to do that. So. Um, I've got a question on your um, damages. Yep. In your bidding and stuff, you would put in damages. Well, sometimes when these government officials behave badly, the damages are not monetary or immediate. They are something which may occur down the road. Yeah. So how do you claim that damages have occurred right now when they haven't occurred yet? Uh, damages that haven't occurred yet haven't. Then there's no damages. Right. That's, that's impossible. It doesn't matter what may happen down the road, it hasn't happened. Damages are only what I, what can you prove? You can't prove a future event, but I can prove that I was damaged now if you can. And then for actual amounts, are you talking about as well? Well, of course, damages might be how many days yeah. it takes to defend or how to prepare. Or oh, absolutely. Account. And that's why number one, a fee schedule always helps too. Um, $1,000 Yeah, aside from that, there's lots of case law, like uh, lots of case law even from down the US. You can start to bring that in just to bring in other, like, other sources uh, to say, well, you know what? This court over here said that uh, you know my time was worth. Uh, what's that one down in California? I think somebody sent me a copy of this. Grand for what's that? Twenty-five grand for twenty-three minutes. Yeah, yeah, That's that was that was that. He, yeah, the guy sued the government. He won. He was awarded uh, twenty-five thousand dollars for every. For twenty-three minutes of incarceration. For twenty-three minutes. 
and so people have now people have used that to base their uh, to base their, uh, their their damage assessment at according to this decision, my time in jail is worth twenty five thousand dollars for every twenty three minutes, and I was in jail for six and a half weeks. <laughs> based on that calculation, you want me to wear this condom or this one? Because you're getting it. Oh, you are going to get it, my friend. Okay. That should be in your pleadings. <laughs> okay. Just a little switch up here. Yeah. Hypothetically, we have encountered a controversy. We have tried to remedy with Crown. Crown has gone for silent, which is what I understand that they do. Yep. And refusal to sell. That's right. That's a refusal to sell. Okay. So we've defaulted them. Yep. Uh, a hearing date is set, or you have a summons, or what have you. You're going into court now. Maybe you can discuss exactly the procedure as to how you would deal with it. Now that this paperwork has been settled with the Crown, maybe a yep. copy has been sent to the court file, how are you dealing with the judge at that moment when they call your name for the number of the... That's file? why I highly recommend already having your motion filed into the court a week in advance from a hearing date. Yeah. And that your motion has all your evidence and your pleadings in it. So you're in initiating. Criminal. You're initiating before the actual uh, original court hearing. date. Yeah. Well, if there's a court date, you're initiating nothing. Okay. You're defending. They've initiated. You're going to court. Right. But when you said it, that's why you wanted to file your your hearing your yes. hearing your motion. Are you the one initiating it before the court date to get this thing quashed immediately, or are you going to deal with it on their ter terms and their dates when they want you in court to deal with it? Well, you have to show up for a date that they've given you. Right, you're, you're the defendant. Okay, let me just see if I can be a little more clear. They okay. want you at court on the 15th. They've ignored, for the most part, everything yep. that you've done. Yep. Do you go and file a motion set for hearing to dismiss prior to the 15th, or do you just let it go oh, and no, deal I with the matter on the 15th? Deal on the, deal with it on the 15th, or even your, you could put right in there, yeah, if you want to hear this matter before the 15th, I'm okay with that. I, I wouldn't call for a specific date. Just say, just go on the 15th like you uh, were So let's to. assume we're, we're there on the 15th and we're about to commence, they call the file. Maybe you can kind of do a play-by-play -play on what you do, how what they do, and how okay, you do Okay, yeah, do we, do we need that. most of this stuff, I guess? Um, yeah, okay, how to how to actually do things in court. Um, because at this point, the, the paperwork is already spoken for you. They've ignored yes. it, and so now they're going to probably test you or, or trick you or whatever. That's why I like it being in, in writing, and again, um, I love to use my brother as an example because he has a wonderful, wonderful ability to do exactly what I tell him when it comes to this kind of stuff. It's awesome. He just does it to the letter when I tell him to do something. Must be a younger brother. No, he's, yeah, you know, he's older. And believe me, it's only when it comes to this. So when I sent him into uh, court every time he's gone in so far, um, especially, the, I love the family court one though because that was a, a, a cute little motion we did up. And uh, the, the entire hearing just went like this. When, when they called him, he walked in, he just said, I'm here for that matter, right? I'm, I'm Darren. I'm Darren Clifford. Don't, well, you know, um, depends on how, what the spelling of, of Darren Clifford is and, you know, that, that kind of nonsense. Now, he identified himself already in the pleadings. It's in writing. Judge has it. Doesn't matter at that point. Yeah, I'm Darren. I'm here. Did you get my paperwork? Did you read my affidavit, Judge? Yes, I read your affidavit. Good. It's all been established in the paperwork. There's nothing to argue about now. Even, I, I wouldn't even discuss it with them. I wouldn't open the document up to discussion or interpretation or, or a judge being able to decide whether or not they even like things that's in there. We don't care. Has the Crown replied to any of it? Because they were served with a copy of the motion as well, obviously. If they haven't, there's no dispute. And based on the based on the evidence you're going to have in the motion, anyways, they have a duty to discharge or dismiss, whatever. I don't care. I do like discharge, actually. That's good. So we'll go with his on that. So that's what I would do. Um, that's not what I have done. But in the Mr. Past. Clifford, what is your name? Your name, sir. What is your name? And that's what they're going to get in that rhetorical kind of uh, back and forth. Maybe you can talk about some of the tricks they might try. Oh, no, I, I just finished walking in and saying, yeah, I'm Dean Clifford. Did you get my paperwork? Right. My paperwork clarifies who I am, right. my jurisdiction. That's why the name thing is irrelevant. 
So the church. If it's properly identified in the paperwork. If it's properly identified in the paperwork and you're pleading, right? And one of your pleading would be, uh, you know, uh, I am uh, I am known as Dean Clifford. I am a common law man of inherent jurisdiction. Uh, no, uh, what is that? A little parenthesis bracket there. Uh, exhibit A. As, or, as evidenced by the particulars of a live birth on file with the province of, uh, of Alberta. I'm a common law of inherent jurisdiction. You know, bracket, exhibit A. Then they can look back and they go, oh, okay, yeah, this is the proper jurisdiction. Are they going to are they going to get you to trip up now verbally? No, it's in writing, and that's why I wouldn't even talk about it. Is the crown rebutting anything? Do they have any facts or evidence to rebut anything that I've provided? No. Dismiss. I'm not even discussing this with you. It's not open to discussion. This is between me and the crown. That's my adversary. You're the net in the middle. So the issue at hand is, is it's yep. a motion dismissed as a request by what means? By lack of jurisdiction over the party? Is that oh, that's all what's in your pleadings. Okay. Right? That's that's the reason. Uh, that's why like the actual thing will say like motion to dismiss or motion to discharge uh, with prejudice. Right. Right. And then you just go right to point number one and start and describe the events and start by identifying yourself, then describe the events that happened, and the fact you contacted the crown and asked them for proof, for proof you're performing a function of government. Mm -hmm. They didn't reply. Blah 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 blah. This and that. And then you bring up 32 and 52 of the charter that says if I'm not acting as an agent of the government, you have no jurisdiction over me. Dismiss this. But you can't counterclaim because it's statutory court. But you may want to let the crown know. I'll get to one sec. You may want to let the crown know that. Give them a give an opportunity. Say I'm still I'm I'm willing to drop my civil claim against you. If you withdraw immediately, make them an offer. If they don't reply now, now they're again they are now again in dishonor before the court because not only are they not replying to you, but they're also refusing to settle. At all. They won't even reply to you. Well, how much more dishonorable could you get? And make sure that's in the pleadings too. So, uh, yes. Yeah, okay. So there's two scenarios that I can see here what you're in this hypothetical example is, one, they've called you to court and you haven't got a motion in. So you're gonna try and go in and respond to that or get, get another date that you can get your motion in, or you've got a motion in. If you've got a motion in, then you've got your affidavit in there and the evidence is before the court. The Crown is already aware of it, so that's, yep. That's one avenue it can go down. Then you, when you go to get in there, you talk to the judge about that and say, yep. well, I haven't responded to it. Yep. Now, what's your experience been in cases where people have failed to put in a motion like that? Because, you know, sometimes people are just going to have the affidavit, maybe, mail it to the Crown, but now they show up in court. You, you just can't drop that in the court file at that point, right? Uh, that'd be the one guy that I talked to four or five days ago that didn't even know what he did when he showed up for court and just said, started waving that live birth record around saying, uh, yeah, this is me, this is me. And he did not want to see that document. As soon as he, if he saw it, he would now be aware of his proper jurisdiction. And now he has a duty, and his duty is to protect him. Right. Right. There's so many cases cases where this has all happened, where people have established common law jurisdiction, and the judge has clearly said, "I'm obligated to protect you." I, I know people that's happened to, and they didn't even know what they did right. Okay. And also, if you're not prepared for the first hearing date. Then you show up and you ask for full disclosure, but do it on the record. And you want to state in no uncertain terms. Uh, so the Crown is telling me that this is full disclosure. They have no other documents to support any of their claims against me. And the, uh, well, oh, well, yes, yes, yes. Excellent. I'll see you in a month. Leave except you're not going to see them in a month because you're going to go into the paper and be like, okay, well, there's absolutely not one shred of evidence here in here that I was performing a function of government, acting as an agent of the crown. They're paying me. There's a contract. There's even an injury. Nothing. Okay, and now they've admitted that is everything they have against you and nothing in there demonstrates anything that would pull, that would pull you into their jurisdiction. That's great. Okay. Do you have, ever have any hesitation to go across the bar? Whether no hesitation. I don't care about the bar. If you've established your proper status, you can go first. Yeah, you can do that. Yeah, you could say before you cross the bar, you can do that too. You could say, uh, you say, uh, you know, I'm 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 Dean Clifford. I'm a common law man of inherent jurisdiction. That's what I'm here as. Do you recognize that? 
and will my rights be protected if I cross this bar? If he says no, are you going to cross the bar? No. Well, then I'm not crossing the bar. Are you crazy? Why would I go anywhere where my rights are not protected? Do you think I'm stupid? Have a good day. Leave. Clearly, I'm in the wrong court because I have inherent common law rights. And if I have no rights beyond that bar, that is not somewhere I should be. And the more of that kind of stuff you get on the record when you're talking to these people, that just makes them want to go away, right? They just, oh, you know, that's... And then you go and you get the, uh, get the transcripts and that's going to be, you know, uh, one of the exhibits in your lawsuit if they continue to proceed against you. Now, if I recall, you made the statement uh, that you can remedy the, the controversy at any time. Uh, we can take this hypothetical situation a little bit further. Uh, you may not know. Uh, you've entered into the jurisdiction of the court, and you may have even been a day or two into trial, right? Uh, is there a process by which you now become aware of the duality and the procedure by which you would deal with that matter at that particular point? Yep. Tell them in the most plain language you can. Oh man, I've just became aware that there is a, a, a real big uh, mis uh, uh, mistake, an error going on. Just became aware of it. Uh, I thought I'd better mention it to the court because uh, it turns out that, it, that it's fraud, fraudulent in nature, and I don't want to be a party to fraud. So it turns out that uh, I didn't even know that they were coming after me trying to say I was an agent of the government. I just found this all out today. Um, and I'm not, I, I don't perform function of government. I'm over here in inherent jurisdiction. They don't have the authority to prosecute me. Uh, so if fraud removes, uh, removes you from a contract, right? It doesn't matter if there's been consent or anything. Fraud voids any kind of a contract. So if you think you're in a contractual obligation with the court because you have been playing ball so far, at any time you can say, ooh, I just became aware that this is actually all complete fraud. I cannot be a party to fraud. I'm sorry. It's a good idea also to ask forgiveness for what where you went wrong, and when you do that, he has to forgive, and it's over. Yeah, I think so. I, I would say I would say I, I did not know that I was willingly participating in fraud. Forgive me. Now that I do, I have a duty to correct the situation, as do you. Just and just be honest about it. like that. You couldn't get more honest than that. Like everybody thinks they got to put this stuff into secret code. <laughs> Right? I'm going to send the judge a coded message and hope he deciphers it. No, just tell him in as plain a language as you possibly can. What do you think he's going to do? Say no? Just one more. Uh, yep. I find, at least when I went to court, one of the things I realized that statements held very little weight uh, as opposed to questions Yes. Uh, with cool. respect to status and what have you. So Good. if you make all the statements, you say you're Mickey Mouse or Elvis Presley, they'll nod and smile and say yes, continue. Uh, so I find that questions have a little bit more power, but what I wanted to ask you with respect to the bar, because it is an interesting question, and I think there's some case law that we have found, or at least some transcripts we have found, that gives rise to the jurisdiction of the court when you cross the bar. If, in fact, you're filing your paperwork before, and you're querying the court, like Russ did prior to crossing the bar, I, uh, I'm wondering whether it would be wise enough to leave that point until you can settle the matter between the Crown and, and, and the court saying who you are and what have you, is this the right court, is the right jurisdiction, or would you would you figure that by the fact that you filed the paperwork, you could just say, adios amigos. Well, oh, they just not show up at all? Well, no, be there, but uh, they're not going to respect your rights, respect the uh, type of person who's on the paperwork. Yeah. Um, Again, talking about that, say, look, I said, you've got my affidavit, you've got my paperwork, you've read it. Yeah. Do you understand it? Yes. Do you understand what my rights are? What's he going to say to him? No? He may so, not yeah. even talk to you if, if you don't cross the bar. I think. Some judges, uh, they'll do anything to lure you across the bar, yeah. and until you do, they'll, they'll just not talk to you. Well, that's, you just, that's, just, that's just, well, that's uh, something else I could get into, is what you can say um, when you walk in there. Again, aside from just say, well, I'm here regarding that matter, to say, yeah, I'm, 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 Dean, I'm Dean Clifford. They'll ask, always ask if you're the accused, and that's when you can say, well, hang on, let's not talk about that yet. All right, just say, because I'm not going to accommodate the name of something that I don't even know. I don't know what it is. Um, don't even need to get into that. When you, when you show up there, you know, I'm here regarding that matter. Are you Dean Clifford? You say, well, yeah, I'm, I'm Dean Clifford, but I'm, I'm Dean Clifford, and I'm here. 
in propria persona. I am here in the proper person. So that hasn't, that still leaves jurisdiction up in the air now. They haven't got jurisdiction. Now it depends on what person you are. And you just tell them, I'm here for that, I was the one charged. They did that, why do you think I'm here? But there's a problem. I'm not an agent of the government. I'm not an agent of the crown. I'm here in appropriate persona. I'm a common law man of inherent jurisdiction. At the time of the complaint, I was a common law man of inherent jurisdiction. I am never not being a common law man of inherent jurisdiction. Right? I'm not who you tell me I am. But I'll tell you what I'm not. Just be as honest, like just talk like this to these guys. There's no reason to... Everybody thinks there's going to be a, some fancy new statement someone comes up with. Man, all you got to do is recite these 11 words and that bastard will get up and run out of the room. Right? No, it's never going to happen, ever. This, they're testing you always. Do you actually know? And they're going to poke you just to, just, oh, you think you're one of the, uh, you think you have an inheritance. Right? Now we go back to the Bible stuff. You think you're, you think you have an inheritance? And we'll, we'll, we'll find out who you are. I know you by your actions. We talked about that at lunch also, right? They're going to be looking at your actions and what you're doing. And by me actions, I mean whether or not you actually know who you are. Or if you just read something online and came in and, uh, I'm here in appropriate persona and I'm a common law man of inherent jurisdiction. Oh, what does that mean? I have no idea, but man, it sounded good online when I read it. <laughs> okay? No, you have to know. And they're going to know because you're going to be able to actually talk to them and explain this and say, well, I don't understand what's going on. Say, I don't understand. And by the way, the word understand in statutory court does not mean I stand under your authority. I don't know where that came from either. Do you understand? No, I do not, I do not stand under you. Well, clearly not. You're standing over there. You're not under me. We don't have a sexual relationship of any kind. <laughs> right? I don't know where stand under came from. But what understand does mean is when they say, do you understand the charges? They're asking you if, you're gonna, if you will assume liability for it. That is what that means. Yes, I understand. Yes, I will assume liability for what the Crown has accused me of. I will, I will assume liability for the charges. I will assume liability for the bond that they're going to be generating and selling that on the markets. That's irrelevant though as well. I, personally, I don't even care about that kind of stuff. Are they not really saying you agree? I, yeah. You just said that, but it's like in plain fact, anytime anybody says that, you understand you're going to do that. Yeah. Or, do you, well, I would, yes. But, but more so, instead of the agreement, because it's statutory court and it's all to do with charges and bonds and everything, they want to make sure that you're assuming liability for what the Crown has Do you done. comprehend you're about to assume liability? There you go. That'd be an even better way of putting it if they wanted us to, uh, if they didn't want us to be confused. Do you understand that you're going to be assuming liability if you say yes? Well, how many of us would say yes then? None. Again, that would make them bad business people, wouldn't it? Well, the other thing about ask, them asking to, if, whether you understand the charges is they've got the first pleadings. They're the ones that put the charges together. If yeah. you don't understand those charges, the point is those charges are there. That's what we want to go to trial with. If you don't understand those charges and you want to change them, that's your opportunity. No, maybe these are the wrong charges, given the facts. How about when they say, do you understand? You say, uh, no, I will not assume liability. Yeah. But no. as he refers to, they are, you're accepting however they laid them out. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. Say, no, they're, they're liable for whatever they, they, they created. The charges they created, they're liable for them, not me. Probably don't even need to get into that. But anyways, um, and again, just so just to say, look, I, you know what? At the, uh, they're going to try to say this is all. This is all matters that you can bring up at trial. <laughs> no, 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 no. I am leaving here in five minutes, and I'm never coming back. It's not going to be a trial unless these people can produce a cause of action, an injury, 
they can prove anything. I will not be coming because, and, and just ask him to say, if I consent to a trial, will my common law rights be protected at that trial? What's he going to say? <coughs> then why would I come to a trial in this jurisdiction? If they have a claim against me, there's this wonderful little room about 200 feet that way in Queen's Bench where an actual injured party can take me to court. But we're not over there. So that tells me they don't have a cause of action. And ask him. And that, like I say, like, uh, that's when you say, now listen, say, I'm not putting up with any more of your guys' bullshit. Everything you say and do here, I'm going to be swearing out an affidavit of it, and I'm going to add you to a civil claim in Queen's Bench for attacking me in statutes. Are you participating in what they're doing? You know, the judge who tries to bullshit you. Are you participating? Are you helping them to attack me? You're supposed to be protecting me. Say that to him. What's he going to do? Arrest you for contempt of court? Do you use the special appearance at any point? Inappropriate persona is special appearance. That's what that means. And the proper person, it doesn't admit to jurisdiction. That is, by definition, a special appearance. In fact, this is this works so well. There's a Supreme Court case site in the United States. Don't know which one. That basically led to lawyers being barred from using that in the courts when defending a client. And I read that one. And that's why lawyers cannot challenge jurisdiction in statutory court. First of all, yes, they're statutory in nature. That'd be like denying your own existence, number one. <laughs> number two, um, a general appearance binds you to statutes and legislation. So if they showed up and they said, well, you know, I'm, I'm a lawyer for so-and-so and I'm here in appropriate persona, or he's here in appropriate persona, that has the effect of challenging jurisdiction. And any lawyer that does that now is basically disbarred. You've got a great law dictionary definition of inappropriate. I was kind of laid out and just said very nicely, if you like to read it's quite to the point about the term how it works. It says, you know, Do you want him to come up and read that right on the, uh, come up and read it on the microphone then. Come on, here. Right. Okay. Okay. Uh, appropriate persona. In his own person. It is a rule in pleading that pleas to the jurisdiction of the court must be pleaded in propria persona because if pleaded by attorney, they admit the jurisdiction as an attorney is an officer of the court and he is presumed to plead after having obtained leave which admits the jurisdiction. Uh, an appearance may be in propria persona and not need not be by an attorney. Right. So an attorney couldn't do it because it's in, in doing so it's already admitted to the jurisdiction of court, so it's a, mm -hmm. one clause to the other. Yes. It's kind of reconciled to it. Yes, in plain English, that would mean it's only almost denying their own existence at that point. Yeah. As far as I'm concerned, that would disqualify them from, from their job if you try to deny your own existence. I don't exist. Oh, well. What gives you standing to speak then? Um, another thing you want to make sure. How many times have you asked if you're representing yourself? Every time. Are you representing yourself? Yes, I'm representing myself. Okay, I'm not going to get into, I can't represent myself because I am myself. Okay, that's not, that means nothing. It's got nothing to do with what's going on. Um, when they ask you if you're representing yourself, and your first reply should be, I am the authorized representative of the name. I'm the authorized representative. If you're just the representative, they view you as being unauthorized. And if you're the unauthorized representative, they don't care what you have to say, but they're going to make it look like they do and just, oh, oh yes, okay, mm -hmm. as the trial's going on, oh, well, very good point, Mr. Clifford. Uh, you know, da, 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 da. Uh, guilty! Because I basically have just said nothing. I'm unauthorized. So you want to be the authorized representative when you get there. A uh, good one we found uh, for BC anyway, we've got a thing with BC Court of Appeal, it was a uh, unrepresented, and the court has a duty to assist, assist the unrepresented. Yes. I don't know if I like the word, it's a, the name is not unrepresented. 
because I'm the authorized representative. Is that what you're going with that? Would you want to say you're no. just, just unrepresented? It's just a distinction to being self-represented. There's nobody representing me. I am just okay. here. Right. I'm in here. I would say if you're representing yourself, you remain unrepresented. They even say that. Oh. Like they've even said, oh, Mr. Clifford's unrepresented. Okay. Okay. I said, like, wait a minute, didn't I just say I was representing myself? How could I be unrepresented? And that's referring to the duty to have the appearance of a fair trial, which means yeah. proper uh, legal support, and you don't have it, so now the court is bound to provide some assistance to you. I think that's probably what they try claiming. I don't think that's what's going on. It, it has happened. It has happened, eh? It has happened. Okay. Well, the judge would probably ask you who authorized you. If you're in your common law capacity, sure. it would happen. So how, how did you answer that? Who authorized you? Okay. Well, well if, you're an author, if I'm an authorized representative... Oh, boy, I'm going to kick myself in the foot here if I can't come up with the answer to that in three <laughs> seconds or less. Um, Take longer if you need to. Nice. Uh, that is where... Oh, uh, if you're walking in there, especially with a live birth record, I would say, number one, um, this authorizes me. Um, I could do better than that, though. Hang on. Uh, produce your declaration if you want there, or some kind of an affir affirmation that you, as the man appointed, appointed yourself, uh, whatever. I can get creative with that. I can't answer that the way I want to answer that about, right now. As an answer, do you have any evidence that I'm not the authorized representative? I like that, because your claim stands uh, until somebody proves the claim to the contrary. See, again, I probably should have come up with that before him, but... <laughs> <laughs> there you go, yeah. I was going to say, it sounds like something I would have said. <laughs> and that's, that, there, so I like that one already. So props to him for that one, because I know I've even talked about that before in the videos, to say until somebody can provide any evidence that I'm not authorized, my claim stands. You did say that in... There you go. See, I'm smarter than I think sometimes. <laughs> Man, I could fill books with half the shit that I've forgotten. Um, okay, so authorized representative, exactly. And they're not going to challenge that. Uh, right, um, so I'm, and also, for people that like UCC law, that's in the UCC. The authorized representative is never liable. So you can never be liable if you're the authorized representative of something. That's why lawyers are never liable. You don't see them going to jail when the name is found guilty. Get into the, 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 the role of titles with the judge if you want. Say, well, that name is a title. The accused is a title. And, it, 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 and as far as I understand, it must obviously be statutory in nature because it was created by the government when they issued the birth certificate and then fraudulently conveyed it to me. So if that's the case, um, you know, just get into that kind of stuff with the judge and let them know you actually know what's going on. And we start talking like that, you know, because if it's statutory in nature and it was fraudulently conveyed to me, and then say, uh, it seems to me that uh, that basically would in effect be almost like a license I would have, you're claiming I was operating through at the time of the complaint, and I'm not aware of any facts or evidence that uh, demonstrate that I was performing a function of government at the time of the complaint. That, that, that's real big, especially uh, even money you made, you know, if it's income tax stuff. You can just clarify that. Well, did I make all this money? performing a function of government. Like, did I benefit from the government when I made that money? Acting as their agent? No. So what taxing authority do they have? Because if it's anything that is below the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, 52 and 32, I don't care. Well, the Income Tax Act says this. Well, that's great. Does the Income Tax Act supersede the Charter of Rights and Freedoms? No. It's inconsistent with the Charter of Rights and Freedoms because I'm not government. So I don't care what it says. Um, in regards to licensing, yep. I'm a veterinarian and I'm just so allowed to not have to practice veterinary medicine with the license. Do you have any, have you tried that at all times that aspect? I don't see why you couldn't do your own. Again, that comes down to even though you've had that license the enti entire time you've been a veterinarian, have you ever actually acted through the license even though you've been in possession of one? Mm -hmm. And can they ever prove you actually acted through it? Right? Like if I'm sitting on my couch at home and I've got my feet up on the wood stove and someone comes kicking my door in, they walk, run in there and, you know, freeze! Produce your fishing license! I think I have one. Hang on, okay. There you go. And I'm having a beer while I'm sitting beside my wood stove. You're not allowed to be drinking and fishing at the same time! 
that I'm not fishing. I gave him a license, he asked for it, it's theirs, I'm obligated to give it to him if he asks for it. Was I fishing? No. I had it. I'm in possession of the license. Does that, do, am I operating through the license at the time of the complaint? No. And they can never prove that you are or you were. So would you recommend? Oh, no, no, so I guess we were done. Go ahead. Uh, would you recommend just uh, not renewing a license? Not I'm not going to recommend anything, but uh, that's your own choice. Um, is it a really big deal to the point where you're willing to risk? your livelihood to surrender the document not operate under it any longer it's always, yeah. then you gotta weigh that out make that decision for yourself it's if it's worth the fight personally I think it is because I just like to fight <laughs> <laughs> come on you know go to the bar hey buddy you wanna fight ah them's fighting words <laughs> well I for, for one I know a, a chiropractor and uh, I uh, chartered account, they both gave up their license. They said, you know, I'm just going to operate and not use this anymore. As long as you believe you can Absolutely. get yeah. customers yeah. that are willing to do business with you. And they're constantly care. They yes. Will... While you're not licensed anymore now, then that's, then of course you can do that and I recommend it. But if it comes down to, things are starting to come back the other way now where mm -hmm. uh, I know people that have actually gone to like, big, like a big company they work for and just said, hey, look, um, and just been honest with these people. It turns out that actually all I have to do is take back my TT from you guys and I don't have a social insurance number anymore. I surrendered to the government, not that I ever did have one. No, we'll get to, I'll ask you in a sec. Um, I want you guys to stop taking deductions off my check and then show them where, uh, and I think there is case law about that, where they're not even obligated to or you know, uh, contact CRA and then show them the paperwork and just actually just talk to people. I did that. Yeah, and a lot, you're gonna find a lot of times they just go, oh, okay. And if they don't say, well, okay, now I've got to play hardball with you a little bit. Say, uh, I'm ordering you to stop taking deductions off my check. And if you don't stop, I'm going to sue you. And I'm going to win. And if you fire me because of that, that's discrimination. And then I'm really going to sue you. And then I won't need my job anymore anyways, because I'm going to be sitting in your house by the time I'm done. And they know it, and they're terrified of those kind of lawsuits. Terrified. And all they got to do is stop taking deductions off your check. Um, okay, you and then you, yeah. Coming back to the licensing thing, it's like me having a driver's license and being pulled over and saying, oh, I'm not acting as a, in the capacity or in the status or working for the federal government in any function. Yeah. But what was my intent of having the license in the first place? So the question I'm asking you is... It doesn't matter what your intent for being in possession of it is. Were you acting through it or not? They're not judging your intent when you go to court. Besides, you can always say, well, I was told if I didn't get this and carry this with me, even though I'm not acting through it, if I don't have this with me, that I'll get beaten up, thrown in jail, and they'll steal my truck. Well, in a sense, if I didn't I have, have a license, or if I didn't renew it, then it's pretty obvious, right? Yeah. But since I do have it, I'm just saying that that's a pretty fine line, is it not? I don't think so. You don't think so? Not at all. Just because I have it. Isn't law about intent? Because I can get up one morning. The reason I have the license is I can, uh, again, man, we have multiple capacities. We have un the unlimited right to act in any capacity we want. So I have the license so that I, I can do that should I choose. One day I may wake up and decide to go work for the government. Probably not me. <laughs> <laughs> There's a very good chance that that'll never happen with me. But. I, I may choose to, who knows, I may wake up tomorrow a uh, completely new individual and decide that I love the government. We'll so what's stopping them. us from using that as, like for example, what's, 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 what's stopping everybody from having no liability all the time? Oh no, no, you're assuming full liability when you get rid of the license. You it's the opposite. Insurance. You can't get insurance. Yeah. You are, when, uh, the, the, more, the more liability you assume for your actions, the more sovereign you become, if you want to call it sovereign. A true sovereign takes complete responsibility for everything that they do. From stepping on an ant to, to murdering another human. You take full liability for your actions. Right? It's actually a desire to not be liable for anything that has gotten us all into this mess. I don't want to be liable for that. Oh, here's a license. Oh, sweet! Ah, give me another car! Right? That is what an irresponsible individual does. Gets a license and then drives like an idiot because they know their insurance is going to cover them anyways and then society pays for it. 
So it's actually, it make, you're more irresponsible the more somebody else assumes liability for your actions. Because then you don't give a shit, you'll just do whatever you want. And more controllable. Yes. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, because whoever assumes liability for you is the person that's now in control. So going by that law, if I assume all liability for myself, who controls me? Me, I'm the principal. Because I'm assuming liability, I'm in control. If I want a government to assume all liability for me, then they're in control. And that's exactly what's going on here. Licenses we can operate through that remove liability. But you're going to obey this when you do it, and you're going to pay taxes when you act like an idiot. Uh, I've always said that freedom and responsibility are inverse. The more free you want to be, the more responsible you have to be. Absolutely. Uh, I would just comment on Moira's case. The one thing that I thought of when she said that with respect to getting rid of licenses, people should be careful with because one of the privileges with those licenses is having a professional corporation with a particular name designation, like veterinarian or chiropractic or whatever. And you could run into problems later on if you decide to carry on or what might look like carrying on business with those names without permission. So you might have to be called something completely different that might not offend the college. Well, um, yes, agreed, because then it feels like I can't call my, I can't start up uh, like the, the Dean Clifford Law Practice and call it the Bar Association of Canada. <laughs> right? Actually, you know, I earned my degree, Doctor of Veterinary Medicine, prior to licensing. Nice. Yeah. I'm, just, yeah, I'm just talking about it, the licensing with respect to no, the professional corporation. They only have the right to call themselves licensed veterinarians. There's a difference between calling yourself and holding yourself out to be a licensed veterinarian. Yeah, you can call yourself, yourself an unlicensed veterinarian. 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 So the separation is calling yourself licensed veterinarian. Person. Yeah, you could just call yourself just veterinarian. Right. You're not saying licensed yeah. or unlicensed. Oh, I'd agree with that. Yeah, yeah. Just, just, just weigh it all out before you do anything, though. And then another big thing, too, is you want to make sure that you're still going to have a client base when you do that. A lot of people, for some reason, the minute you're unlicensed, you're viewed as, like, like non-legitimate, right? Like, you're just, a, you're basically a drug dealer at that point. Yeah. No, that, that's great. That's what I mean. So as long as you're comfortable doing that, they're comfortable with you doing it, you're going to be able to conduct business and not, you know, not ruin your life to make a point with the government, then by all means, do it. Um, oh boy, I had something I was going to add to that and I just cannot remember now. Oh well. Oh. <laughs> That's not a practical note yeah. Sometimes the removal of something is, is more obvious than the replacement of something. If you were to say that uh, you were now certified by whomever, and you could get a certification, okay? Yes, clearly. Is the same problem well, deceived by one or easily deceived by if you If you graduated, uh, you got a veterinarian degree, that is that that qualifies you as a veterinarian, not the license. Yeah, qualified, certified. So certified, yeah. Yeah, you're already you're already a qualified veterinarian. You 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 went through school and they said, yeah, you qualify. You're you you know what you're doing. Nothing more than a social proof training for permission from the government. The government's going to protect you because they're licensed, so they must be also for insurance. Yes, and that's a good thing. Like I honestly believe that's that's great that you have to be certified to do certain things where you could harm people. You know, uh, you just don't put a dentist sign up on your window. You know, and your first customer walks in, you're like, okay, hang on a sec. I got to I got I got to read the first page of this welcome to dentistry book. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. See, so a lot of this stuff really is good thing. Like, I actually do not want the breakdown of the system that we've got. The system is great. We are just completely not using it. All we have to, it's just a little switch. We just have to leave one jurisdiction and go to the other. And everything is still here. Everything still operates. We can still bank accounts. Everything's great. We're just flipping the roles. Now, no, we're not the trustee anymore, if you want to put it in terms of trust law. Now we're the beneficiary, we're the ones in power, we own the land, we're not foreigners, right? And again, that's the other thing I was thinking about at lunch, I love to, I love to ask people this one, uh, usually it's at the beginning though, I always ask, down in the United States, and I'm not getting into which United States, um, in the United States, who has the most rights and gets the best health care on the planet? Illegal Mexicans. Illegal Mexicans. They don't need a driver's license, they don't need any ID, they get free health care, free education, checks every second week from the government, they get the best of everything with none of the statutory obligations attached to it. So that should tell you right there this is true. Because that's living proof of it. And everybody's pissed off. Oh, gee, damn illegal Mexicans coming up here and 
getting everything for free, say, you know what, don't be pissed off at them because you don't have the courage to do the same thing. Yeah. That's just projecting your stupidity onto them. There was actually an article not that long ago that California is planning to legalize all illegal immigrants. Of course, they want to be able to tax them. And there was a huge outcry. Yeah. What for? And I'm like, darn, they all are getting it. Yeah. Yeah, they want to be able to tax them. That's when they tried to give them all driver's licenses a couple years ago. We're going to give them all driver's licenses. Everybody's, no! What? Oh, I can't believe you're going to give them driver's licenses in our country. They're not even here legally. If they have no ID, they can't be charged at all for any crime. They were trying to do a good thing by giving them a driver's license to say, well, yeah, these people are driving like idiots and killing motorists on the highways and acting like idiots, and we can't regulate them. Let's give them all driver's licenses so we can regulate them and tax them. That's just proof. That, that's the, the most empirical proof I have of everything I'm talking about is the situation in the U.S. with, with the immigrants. You cannot buy proof like that. Well, it's all in the United States. Exactly. Right? Yeah. yeah. So <clears throat> um, <clears throat> that's why, like, uh, like treaty treaty natives here in Canada actually have it worse than us. Right, because they actually have binding contracts that they're just completely screwed in those in those contracts. They would have they'd be better off, and that's why I tell people if you just left the land of Aboriginals and joined the land of the original people or the inhabitants of the landmass or uh, uh, illegal non-resident Canadians. Right, I'm illegal. I'm driving illegally. I of course I am. I'm driving lawfully. I have to be driving illegally. <laughs> I admit to that. Yep. Illegal. That raises the issue of crossing borders. You've mentioned only in your conversations. Live birth. Live birth, re birth record. And there's so much evidence that... Uh, and you, you can go up the scale of what you want to start crossing the borders with. I'm going to stop pacing now. Um, it's my subconscious. Um, live birth record. You don't need to get it apostilled, but you can. Because anything issued in Canada is automatically recognized in the United States anyways. Technically speaking, you can use a live birth record to go anywhere. Now, that doesn't mean you can uh, drive down to Colombia, cross the border, say, see this live birth record? I'm a child of God. I'm going to do whatever I want in your country, you bastards. <laughs> You're going to get shot. <laughs> okay? There's some common sense associated with this. See this live birth record? Man, I went to see Dean speak. You better not fuck with me. Right? They're just going to shoot you. Well, that means you actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, no, actually, they, uh, have you guys ever seen that letter from that senator from Texas, like from back in the 80s? I got a copy of it somewhere where he sent, uh, the senator sent a letter to, I think, the attorney general for Texas, basically saying, hey, there's some problems here. There's a lot of people starting to wake up and realize that we have inherent rights and they're removing their contracts with the government. And our police are starting to like to, to, to really harm these people because they don't know that people actually can go back to their original jurisdiction, their in, or inherent rights, and not be regulated by the state at all. It says it right in the letter from the senator. I'm reading this just going, you got to be kidding me. This is 25 years old, and I'm just seeing this now, and I've been part of this movement for 12 years. How have I never read this? It's all the evidence is out there. Everything, and you know, that's another thing I'm going to mention too now that I've raised that point. I think I did touch on this, or maybe I didn't because I've been speaking to so many people recently. Um, why does everybody want to reinvent the wheel? Right? Everything we need exists right now. We couldn't make something better than what exists right now if we tried. But everybody wants to start cr like creating their own new public entity and letters patent and all this other stuff. Now, I'm not digging on any of that stuff. I'm not saying, like, don't do any of that, and it's, oh, that's really stupid. Don't do that. It's unnecessary to do all this stuff. It's all here already. We just have to take it. Okay? Your live birth record. They know damn well, and that letter from the senator proves it. That guy probably was one of the few that actually did know, maybe. But he sent the letter saying, like, to the, to the Attorney General, we got to start educating the, 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 uh, the state troopers. Because we're in a lot of trouble if they start really harming these people because we're liable for that. We're supposed to be protecting those ones. That's what the gist of the letter was. And I was like, holy shit. I'm like, I can't believe I'm even reading this. So clearly there's a reason that's not very widely dispersed. Right? 
that kind of stuff. So the, all the evidence is out there. We know all we have to do go, is go back, and I, I love the word original jurisdiction. You gotta just go back to the original jurisdiction where your rights are. And you can do that anyways. Does, again, just because you have a license to do something doesn't mean you're doing that at that particular time or ever. But I have the license should I want to do it one day. Why do I have it? I don't know. I just went and got it. I just felt like it. Why did I just take two steps this way? I don't know. I just wasn't even thinking about it. I just did it. What does it matter if I got a license? Maybe we got the driver's license because we were induced by a fraudulent statement. There's no question we were uh, intimidated into doing it, right? It's, it's, it's a product of extortion intimidation, right? Extortion, 346 for yeah. Criminal Code of Canada, and intimidation, 423 subsection 1. Nobody wants to say <laughs> Yep. Put that in the letter and say the only reason I got this is you people told me if I got pulled over without it, you'd kick the living shit out of me, throw me in jail, steal my truck, and then give me a bunch of fines. That's why I got the license. I didn't want the damn thing, and I've never operated through it, but I, I got it because I... I what are they going to do? They gonna, yeah. I asked a cop on the stand that one time, actually, in Brandon. Uh, I said, uh, I go, uh, if, I, uh, if I hadn't have given you a license, what would you have done to me? And he actually answered and he said, well, I would, I would have arrested you on the spot. And you could actually just see the judges go, <laughs> And back then I didn't really know enough about this. I could probably go back, get, get those transcripts and just, and just prove, yeah, this cop actually just testified that if, if I didn't produce a license, he would have arrested me. You want to talk about how many civil and criminal charges that is right there in one phrase? And about, oh my God, I could probably list how many violations of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that is. Aside from uh, number four and twenty, I think those are my, my two favorites. Number twenty, I believe, is uh, belonging to an organization, being forced to belong to an organization, Article Four, slavery, and that's what they're violating. If the Crown can't prove you were being paid something, by the way, to perform a function of government, at the time of the complaint, what was I being paid, and when did you pay me? Because I don't work for free, and if you don't have any payroll records and you're claiming I worked, I was working at the time of that complaint. It was against my will, and it was for free. And that's two violations of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. How many more do you want? Keep talking. That's when it starts to get real. So that's the kind of stuff. That's why you want to attack that question. Number one, they do have to pr prove you're acting as an agent to the state. And if they do prove you're acting as an agent to the state, and you're, it was by force, and they didn't pay you, well, now that just opens up a whole other can of worms. That's how powerless they are against this stuff. They can't do anything. And like I said before, we realize that once we turn it around and we're no longer the trustee, they are, and we can do to them what they were doing to us over here, then we start to take back what's ours. And that's the fun stuff. And that's uh, this old, and then getting, getting good with the civil claims. Um, download. That's like a, an actual lawsuit and just look at the way it's all put together and then just say, well, okay, I can copy, don't copy the lawsuit, obviously. I'll just change some names, you know? No, the format, just copy the format. Get the cover pages from the internet for whatever province you live in, you know, Queen's Bench Forms, and then just say, okay, well, this is how they, you know, just kind of put the whole thing together in form. Well, I'll just put my body of stuff here, all the stuff I wrote for substance, attach all my exhibits to the back and just, just emulate what they're doing. The best, the best uh, teaching we ever got on putting a lawsuit together was the reply the province gave us to our first lawsuit against them. My buddy put together this, this uh, no offense dude if you're gonna watch this, terrible lawsuit. <laughs> <laughs> Pleadings were awful, evidence was awful, everything in it was awful, but it got the desired effect. They sent us back this like, defense to it and like all bound and cover pages and the little tabs coming out for exhibits and everything we're like oh sweet like we should do this <laughs> right it's all learning experience so we did we went down to staples and uh my other friend uh, he was the first one to produce an actual like like man like the clear pages everything it's all like bound and and everything when they got that they just went what the hell like it was it was it was law school um in 10 minutes or less. So don't, anybody who tells me that they, they don't know where to start, come on, just use your head, really. How do you put a lawsuit together? Well, 
download, go get one from the court files. They're, it's all public knowledge. Go get a copy of one. You should probably get a copy of the rules of court. Yeah, and read them. They're all online. I I'd say that in the videos. They're there. Read them. They're right there. And the best part is, too, when you go down to the courthouse, you're not a lawyer. They are required to help you with all this. They can't say, oh, I can't give you legal advice. It's not legal advice, it's the procedure. What's the procedure? I don't, if I can't, if you don't tell me the procedure, I'm just going to barrage you with a bunch of shit until I get it right. Take your pick. I <laughs> uh, don't mean to change the subject too much, but no, I, you, you had mentioned one time on a call that you were planning on heading to the States and you were going to go across the border. Yeah. Uh, without any passports, and that I think, if I recall, correct me if I'm wrong, you were contacting the Secretary of State or some sort of agency down there to uh, give them uh, advance notice. Did you get a response, and if you did, what was said with that? Didn't even get around to sending that off. But yeah, what I was doing is I was supposed to be, because I wound up in jail, I think, three days after that. Yeah. And I haven't got everything sorted out since then yet. Uh, I was going to send a just a, a, a certified copy, or even just a photocopy of the live birth record with a little letter I was going to do up really nice, send it down to the State Department for whatever state I was going to be cr crossing, or even just a, a U.S. Customs or something, and just say, hey, I'm going to be driving down to the United States, and I'm going to be crossing the border, and this is evidence of who I am. Am I going to expect any problems from your customs agents when I cross? And if so, what can I do in advance to make sure that there's no confrontations of any kind? I just want to peacefully cross the border. See, is that so hard just to contact somebody and just say that? No. What are they going to reply with? Get a passport. Get a passport? <laughs> yeah. What's your criminal record? Yeah. Well, just then to ask them right in there. Just say, is there any law? It says that I cannot cross that jurisdictional boundary without, with, without uh, like a driver's license or a passport. You, you actually don't need one. That document is your, uh, that is your passport. That's already a passport. That's your, where do you get a passport from? Passport. Birth certificate. That means it's lesser than the birth certificate. And where does the birth certificate come from? It doesn't cut, yeah, not directly, but it's a result of. So what's the highest document that you could possibly produce? Live birth record. How could you, how could they compel you to have a lesser document? We've already got the principal document. Yeah, but are they aware of it? If you contact them, yes. If you talk to, again, when you're an administrator, sovereign, I don't care what you want to call it, and you're the top guy, head, who said head of state earlier? One of the guys who was here. Yeah, there you go. I love that word. That's great. Yeah, when, when, this is, when it's your, when your estate, I'm not even writing anything, your estate, it's a state. Just drop the E. That's all the states are. United States of America, they're just all estates. That's all they are. Corporations, corporate bodies, body politic, I don't give a shit what you call them. It's all well, almost the same thing. We'll get to it just one sec, because I was going somewhere with this. Ah. You're the head of state for your state. When you talk to another state, who do you talk to? The other head of state. I don't talk to peasants. Peons. There's a little P on most people's passports. I, I, I'm not convinced that actually does stand for peasant yet, but it probably does. I don't talk to peasants or peons. I talk to other heads of state. You don't show up at the border and start bitching at some guy who's making seven bucks an hour because he's a failure at life and start complaining about your live birth record, okay? That guy's pretty grumpy because he's got a really shitty life. He doesn't want to argue with you. What's that? Yeah, and I've had a very big gun, yeah, exactly. And he's so ignorant and arrogant that he actually probably would shoot somebody if he just felt like it because they're really quite sad, I don't know. Um, Two more things that you yep. talked about. One is, is uh, maybe you can go into a little more detail with it. One is that I think you said you sent a bunch of paperwork with respect to the Attorney General giving you notice with respect to your intention of your ID or whatever. I'm not quite sure what that was. Yeah. And the second point is, is you talk about how you went and assisted some people in Saskatchewan with respect to the revenue issue. Yep. And you filed something with the court which changed the whole the, the whole process of the court 
and he believed that there was a process, provost marshal represented there. I'm more interested in the procedure though. What did you do in order to set that up as well? So both the attorney you, general you, and that one. Be the only reason, know. again, we don't even know who the guy was that showed up, but he clearly was not, uh, he was wearing no police stuff of but any kind. He military procedures when he was walking. Yeah, around. like I say, like the, everything, uh, I'm not going to get into particulars about it. And I don't even like the story because I don't want people thinking that all you got to do is call the provo every time there's a problem, right? In fact, like never do that. Like, please don't bother that guy. He's got a lot of shit he's got to do. Um, only if you really are in legitimate fear of your life, like your safety. Um, they'll tell you that. It doesn't matter who you are. Even if you're one of these citizens that's not protected by the military because you're under Canada's jurisdiction, if you're a legitimate fear for your life, the military will come to your aid. That's their duty. It doesn't matter who you are. But I mean legitimate. Legitimate is not, well, um, CRA is taking me to court. So I'm in fear for my life because they might throw me in jail if I lose. That's, th that's not what that means. We all know that. And that, the, the reason you're going to jail is because you don't know what's going on. The other part of that story is, yeah, the, that's when I was starting to really get the last of this stuff together and perfected. We sent, I sent a couple documents in, and it was purely in trust law, the, the documents I filed, which was uh, clarified who the guy was that was coming down to the courts, what his status was, his standing, his title, if you want to call it. I've changed it now to title. I used to say the word status. Now I like the word title, because that's what this all is. It's all titles. What's your title? And we clarified who he was, and then we clarified who I was because we put in formal notices that he was appointing me as the administrator for his estate. His estate being, uh, now we know obviously not the certificate of birth name, but the other one. And all the documents were pur purely an inherent jurisdiction. And so when we got down there, the courtroom had been moved. And uh, when we walked into the courtroom, um, and of course the clerk of the court tries that stuff with you, well, you know, uh, are, are you are you so-and-so? And I say, no, I'm here to speak uh, speak for him. I'm his authorized representative. Oh, uh, are, oh so you're a lawyer? I said, no, I'm not a lawyer. Do you have, did you get permission from the court to speak? You know, and I hate that one. That's that's the one that sets me off. Mm -hmm. I always just, and I just kind of looked at her and I said, no. I said, I don't require permission from the court to do anything. Oh. Mm. <laughs> Goes back to type on our computer. Didn't look at me again for the whole two hours we were there. But either way, judge, uh, they called court in the session, you know, and a uh, uh, buddy that was there, uh, whether he was there for my protection or their protection in case they injured me and I had recourse against them. Who knows? He was there. That's all I know. I uh, did the old, you know, like the boot thing and the picture of Her Majesty and Prince Philip is on the wall behind whoever the judge is, except he wasn't a judge. And he was just uh, in, a, in regular business clothes. No robe, no nothing. And we had about five witnesses there with us. And uh, this was interesting. I was just uh, having a good two hour chat with the guy. Crown didn't almost sit and didn't say a word. They just sat there the whole time. And every time I would bring up certain things about, their, uh, about what they did to this man, she would just slink lower in her chair. And she was looking out the window for like an hour. I was, I was like, gonna ask what she was even doing there. And then, because this guy was doing all the talking, I was about to ask him why he didn't just go and sit down there instead, because he's not a judge, he's clearly just another crown. You're just another crown. That's all you are, sitting up there on the bench. He spent two hours convincing me that we should go to trial and fight, because we're right. Like, the guy was my best friend at times. Like, uh, he goes, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just a man, just like you, you know, like, uh, you know, and he's trying to be my buddy and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And it's probably all that... Uh, what is it, NLP, NLP training? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's probably all that stuff, right? Where he, this guy was like, seriously, if he was, uh, if this guy was Romaine I, and I smoked, I would have left there a non-smoker. <laughs> <laughs> he was just, this guy was unreal. And it's just like, oh, Lee, like he almost even had me thinking at one point, yeah, we should just go to trial and fight this. No, no, wait, bad. Right? It was, I was like, oh, this guy's interesting. But he's the one that knew a lot about the Bible stuff. He started getting into Bible stuff. And I'm far from a master of the Bible. I know some of the good parts. And I have a buddy that's my, um, he's my Bible guy. And this guy said a couple things in this hearing that I just went, holy shit, that is so far over my head that I can't see my own ass. It's just like, that's, I'm not going to talk about the Bible no more with this guy. And uh, then I got out. When we got out two hours later, I'm texting my buddy. And I'm like, what would you say if somebody said to you, and the reply was, who the hell said that to you? I'm like, just answer the question. You're going to love this. <laughs> it was awesome. But uh, yeah, he spent two hours trying to, trying to be my best buddy and convince me we should take it to trial. He, he, was, he was a uh, used car salesman. That's, he knew they had no jurisdiction at all. And he wasn't trying to harm us. He was trying to get our consent 
to allow a trial in a jurisdiction that, that he knew that we weren't in. So it all had to be by our consent, either by silence, uh, ignorance, or just, yeah, yeah, let's, woo, let's go and make some case law. It's going to take this whole system down. Yeah, you know, try to fire us up like that. And I know that's a mistake, right? So, um, so I think that answered that question. That was that well, one here. There's hearing. one other point he said with respect to the criminality of the government. Maybe you can talk about his statement there. Ooh, I don't know if I want to oh, okay. talk about that. Yeah, okay. let's just say they, yeah, okay. they they acknowledge what they did, what they do. They they're they're, they're is is lawless. Because as long as they get you over here, there is no law over there, right? They can do whatever they want to over there. But he was just, I think that was another tactic he was using to, to try to, like, yeah, you should, you should take up this, this crusade of righteous indignation and, and, and take down the man because we're just a bunch of criminals and you, could, you, should, you should show us the, the wrongs of our ways. Like, like this, this guy was incredible. I was like, oh, my God, where did he come from? It was crazy. Oh, yeah, I wish everybody had an experience like that. I left going, what the hell just happened? It was neat. So I think I'm the only one that comes out of these hearings just going, man, that was neat. <laughs> so, and that was that one. And then I think the other one, the documents I sent to the gov uh, to recently, like to, to the yeah, uh, attorney general of my province, when I first started kind of getting this all together finally and all was clicking and I realized, oh, wait, I'm right about all this the problem is that's not what's going on over here and that's when i had to kind of correct the model a little bit to allow for that because i couldn't figure out how they were still doing it but i had all this correct so i started sending off letters like uh the birth certificate obviously got surrendered um so i did do that i had previously pre in previous years my life my driver's license went back seven years ago i haven't had a driver's license in seven years now um SIN card uh, number, I haven't used my SIN card number 15 years anyways. I, I don't think I have it. I haven't been in possession of that for years. So I'll let them know that. I said there's no SIN card to return you because I'm no longer in possession of it physically. Driver's license already went back. Here's your uh, birth certificate back. Uh, I'm no longer the trustee of it. I did manage to get that right even though I hadn't gotten that far with most of everything. And I said so all that remains now is you guys are the trustee of my live birth record. That's the only arrangement we now have between our parties except for my fee schedule which has the full force of law so I sent them all the notice of that uh, I did revoke my pledge to Canada I didn't even know how relevant that is I still don't just because my live birth record that I got from Manitoba is weird what we ignore in documents and I, of course they know all about how the human mind works but normally when we're looking at a document we tend to ignore things that are written sideways vertically on the piece of paper i could look at it a dozen times and all of a sudden one day just go holy shit well i'll be damned it's right in there too and that's what i do with the with the live birth record and right there it just said citizenship blah 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 something uh to do with your your uh, uh your your pledge to, to wherever you're a citizen of kind of thing so i just went oh okay well what happens if i revoke my pledge then so that's when I sent it back and I say, here, have your shit back. I revoked my, I revoked my pledge. So I'm not your citizen anymore. I told them to send me confirmation of the uh, civil death of the citizen. I haven't got that yet, but it's because I sent the birth certificate to the wrong department, I think. I'm going to remedy that Which here right away. Oh, no, I want that. Yeah. Besides, they've already got the live birth record. They got the original. And I don't want it back. I love the arrangement we've got going on right now, once I'm in the proper place. What do you recommend for parents, uh, new parents, these days? Registration. Um, <clears throat> oh, and register. That's your claim. That's evidence of your claim. You definitely want to register. And until I see any evidence to the contrary, registration is a, a public record. And if anything, if property does transfer, the only property that trans, or if anything does transfer, it's the legal title, and that's fine legal title to whatever was created for your kids by that registration goes to the government to hold in trust which is the record that secures your claim great just don't use the birth certificate when they send it or send it back say my kids don't require this they're never ever going to work for you people you work for us cfs comes through the birth certificate So for kids, um, if they've already got a social insurance number and they're trying to get jobs, it's so hard for them to get a job without it. Three. Um, 
Yeah, you know what though, but uh, that's we have to start either putting, uh, taking a stand and saying I'm not going to work for any corporation that requires a SIN number. You know, this is the kind. This, this is the kind. We have to start. Government's not going to help us. We have to start setting up our own organizations. Uh, like, like one of the ones I'm thinking of is, you know, we're. Uh, I'm going to be like Santa Claus. Okay, like, a, like a, I'm, I'm, I'm taking names and I'm checking them twice. We're going to know who's naughty or nice. Now, when shit still starts to roll back the other way, we're going to remember this stuff, and you're going to wish you just started paying attention to the law while you had the chance. So, if they won't hire you because they don't have a, a sin number, then you sue them. Get them to say they're not going to hire you because of that, though. Because that's a that, that's a human right violation. They cannot deny you employment and force you to be a part of an organization just to get a job. Again, that's another Universal Declaration human right uh, violation. Yeah, it's pretty difficult when the accountants and lawyers in these corporations tell them that they have to, but that's kind of subject. Yep. Then you know what? What I was going to say was about the birth certificate crossing over the border yep. for children. I have a lover. We're not married. We don't have a license through the government. Yep. Uh, if we have a child, is it just a live birth record? That's it? Like, Regist I've yeah, because a lot of really crazy things that happen to common law marriages where they're not licensed marriages and they try and go across the border and they get detained for a day or two and, and all. Take, taking the live birth record with them? Well, yeah, well, like you want to bring a child over the border. Yeah. You're not you have a live, you have a live, uh, no, yeah, yeah. that's even better. That's what I mean. If you have your, the live birth record for the, for the child, that is their, the government recognized identification, if you want to call it that. Right? Yeah. Contact them and say, I'm going to be crossing the border with, with, my, with my child. We don't have birth certificates because we're not agents of the state. But we do have these live birth records that prove or I, are, are, are evidence of who we are, what our claim is, that kind of stuff. And I'm going to be coming and I'm going to be crossing the border. So it's the same thing as if I was just going by myself. Yeah. Talk to them. Yeah. Just ask them. And then if they say, no, you need a birth certificate or any kind of nonsense like that, um, then there's a lot of other avenues you can go down. You can say, well, based on what law kind of thing. Like, uh, you know, are you, are, you, are you telling me that I'm compelled to become an agent of the state just to be able to travel across the land? Like, who are you? They, they know this stuff. That's why a lot of non-treaty Indians and stuff like that, like, they, do, they just cross the border with nothing. Just nothing. The more legal ident identification you have, Believe me, the more problems you're going to have. Um, for our first son, we didn't um, register his birth because we weren't sure we were still figuring those things out. What we did instead is we had the doctor, um, we, we wrote up the affidavit, she just filled in the details, date, location, time of birth, and yep. was a witness on that document stating the pertinent facts, yep. got a lawyer to come down and notarize it in her office, and that's what we've used. Yep. And see, that's still evidence of a claim. You can still prove now that the, chi the child, child, uh, in statutory meaning, I don't care what that means, in common law, it's a child, it's a little kid, right? Flesh and blood, boy and girl, whatever, I don't care. Jurisdiction is the problem, not the definitions of the words. Everyone has to get that point through their head. I don't care how many times I've got to put it into people's heads and ram it in there. It's got to be part of your subconscious to the point where it's not thought anymore. It's just that you know it. Um, the government certificate the, the registered live birth record is the same thing, it's just recognized by the government because it's been put on the record. So they're both, they both prove the same thing, just one is actually recognized by the government. Doesn't say that they won't recognize the one that you have, I'm just saying this one already is. So that's why it's the best one to use, don't reinvent the wheel, it's right there, it's already recognized, use it, it's your claim. And then back to you about that, the first thing I tell people when they say, well, I can't get a job at this corporation uh, sitting at a desk uh, doing nothing, is I say, good, go learn a trade. Yes. Because plumbing and roofing pays really, really well. And you don't need almost any training to do that. You could be on a roof three minutes after you walk onto a job site. Well, believe me, I went through that encounter with my corporate employer, yeah. which, compelled, which compelled me to go... Yeah. Create my own entity, which I now contract. Yeah, with trades are fantastic, and then you're not uh, then you're not a child of cane working in a, sky, a skyscraper there, making money off the poor working people, right? Mm -hmm. But it's just I wouldn't say is the, the masses out there are so angry. They just listen to accountants and lawyers. And What'd you call me? Sheeple. They are very ignorant. 
Well, I should say I'm still ignorant. I should say naive because I think the mass populace really doesn't know, and if you don't know, how can you? Ignorant? You know, that's another point too. It's it's like uh, we I I don't like what's being done simply because they're actually they're preying on our good faith is what they're actually doing, and to me, everything they're doing is being done in bad faith. And bad faith is a very big thing. If you sue somebody for bad faith negotiations in a business deal or bad faith in a business dealing, that's big money. That's the same as slander and defamation. They really frown on that. So if you can prove that the government was dealing in bad faith when they sent you that birth certificate and didn't tell you what it was all about or what the liabilities attached to it were when you already had a protected birthright, to me, even though they're not obligated to, that's still acting in bad faith. I don't like that. It's not dishonest, but it's bad faith. Again, I don't have to tell you that contract is going to screw you over, but it's bad faith if I if I do it to you, right? That's bad faith contracting. I don't like that. And we're supposed to be like we're the ones preaching: do no harm, be honorable, be respectful, all that kind of stuff. So, lead by example, right? If you want the the government's a mirror of us, they're only what we've been for the last 60 years, which is self-absorbed, greedy ignorant people, right? We're all caught up in greed and uh, ben but what benefits us now the most? How can I steal as much as possible from every single one of you so I can benefit and screw you people over? I mean, that's just, uh, that's why we're in the state of affairs we're in. Um, just kind of off topic, you're talking about um, getting money for labor. <clears throat> what about uh, if you have investments and you get the T5s? from an organization where you didn't register your SIN number. Do you have any opinion on, on how to file those sorts of things? I wouldn't, well, I wouldn't file them, that's all private. Right? That's all private. Um, uh, I know people are going to disagree with me on that because they're going to say, well, no, actually, the only thing they can tax is interest on the money that you have from investments and stuff like that. No, again, that's only over here in this jurisdiction. I don't care what kind of profits you make on investments and interest over here. It's tax exempt. And the proper word for that would be, you're immune, you have immunity over here. You're immune from taxation. I would even call it diplomatic immunity. Yes. So, so uh, earning, earning interest is not acting as an agent? Um, oh, yeah, no. But then you would have to follow, uh, I'm not sure what the Bible says about interest. Well, it says usury is bad, right? Yeah. I was being sarcastic. <laughs> But I'm sure somebody here could probably quote what, the, what it says. So um, if you're worried about it, either pay the taxes on the interest or just don't claim it at all or just stop accepting interest on investments. What documents did he use to open up the account would, would, would be in prima face of evidence of maybe who is uh, in control of that account. Yeah. I imagine they would want some sort of uh, two pieces of identification. Maybe you said no social insurance number, but maybe something else. Yeah, it would be pretty hard to argue who, uh, who's holding that account. Absolutely. They have to prove it. And I, I'm pretty sure that's 21 of the Canada Evidence Act, and they have to prove it. So they have to prove that, again, everything we just talked about today, it all applies. Just blanket across the board. I don't care what it is. But then you got to ask yourself that question I was talking about. Do you want to be accepting interest? If uh, for, for people that are really big on the Bible, if it says that usury is bad and you shouldn't be taking, uh, charging interest on money, then that's going to be between you and him later on. Yeah, that's, that's okay to charge a stranger, but not your family. Okay. Oh, well, perfect then. Okay. Yeah, how about her? It's a foreign jurisdiction. Don't get, <laughs> yeah. don't, don't, don't get friendly with the people you loan to then, I guess. So there you go. Yes. Earlier on, um, one of the ladies asked, what about those who are not born here? and to immigrate here. They would have a birth certificate from their uh, live birth record and live birth in their country and a birth certificate. Yep. The birth certificate would be used here to come to Canada and then subsequently that document Yeah, they would have been issued a new citizenship a status kind of thing, right? And the citizenship status is over here, live birth record wherever they were born is still proof of claim. Well uh, yeah, we think we spoke about that and actually they had a better answer than me. Yeah. Where I said, well I said I guess if you weren't born here so just the first thing off the top of my head is, I guess, you, you don't really have much of a birthright to the land. And her reply was much better than mine uh, should have been, which was, well, uh, that that claim is to the earth. 
Correct. So it still has standing here because I thought about that over lunch and it's like, yeah, that's right, because we have dominion over all the earth, right. and that birth record is evidence of that. Right. So, and again, that doesn't mean you can go down to Colombia <laughs> and start mouthing off to people. Okay, here's the Bible and here's my live birth record. That's my land. Ooh, that belongs to that cocaine lord. <laughs> I don't suggest taking that section. Yeah. With regards to immigrants, when they actually become citizens, they take a citizenship oath which is pledging allegiance yep. to the Queen. Uh, natural born citizens don't take any uh, pledges or yep. you know, allegiances. Do you see a difference with regards to them? Yes, you know? because they made it for that title. As far as I well, no, because oaths no, are only made by the people. That's right. Uh, pledges are fine. To queen the woman, I guess. Yeah, okay. That is the pledge to her yeah, and that's her right. family. Yeah, I'd have to think about that, but uh, I don't see a problem with that either. If they're not going to let you in because of it, number one, th then that's kind of only under, uh, that's almost under protest and duress, anyways. Yeah. Uh, travel across land, th they're never stopping this guy from traveling. They're always stopping this guy and saying you need to get the proper ID to cross borders, but right. they're never really addressing this one, right? Mm -hmm. So you've never, you, you, it's like two different things going on at the same time. Well, just before the UN Declaration of Human Rights was declared, uh, the Queen um, released all of the countries from subject statute of Westminster, being, being 1931, and no, 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 no. released them into their own citizenships and their own nations. Yeah, um, that was uh, that was the King that did that one. Statute statute was Westminster. It? Um, yeah. So it was just it was, it was 48 or 49, just before the 47. 47? Oh, it was already done in 31, yeah. so that's redundant. No, 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 no it no. was. It's just be, just just before the oh. UN just before the UN declaration became forty eight you know, signed, uh, the year before that, the Queen released all of the subjects from ju subjecthood into citizens of their own nations. Yep. And so they were no longer the subjects of the Queen; yep. they were citizens of their own nation. And that was a, a you know a, an act, proclamation, whatever in forty seven. Yes. Uh, because by being a subject, they would have been in violation of the UN Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, so they were released from being subjects, and I just see that they, uh, uh, when people are pledging to be a citizen, it sounds like they're actually going back into being a subject, uh, rather than what occurred with that. Uh, yeah, absolutely. we pledge the allegiance Except to the consen queen and yeah. the royal family and their Except it's citizens. consensual. They're not forcing you to do nothing now. So they found a way to release you and then recontract with you. They couldn't physically whip you anymore. So they found a way to do it contractually. But then, isn't that pledge only when you're acting as the immigrant? Ask them. What was this thing of 47 called? I've never even heard of it. Oh, I, I don't remember. It passed a law, and uh, the Queen said that all British subjects are now citizens of Canada. And, and their respective nations. It was yeah. also Australia and New Zealand. I, I, I prefer the statute of Westminster anyways of, of 31 which releases all British colonies from the control of Britain and gave them gave those countries the right to go and draft their own charters, right? But, well, they, yes, but, but they were, were all still, still British subjects. The people well, until <coughs> supposedly. They were. That didn't mean that, there was, that, the, that just those countries could do it. It meant we all could. Every single one of us can go and start draft our own charter now and become our own independent nation because we, we don't have allegiance to England. That's a more important declaration that they made there, even though the Universal Declaration of Human Rights would have made that now obsolete as well. But going back to that, I think that's the more important document, right? They, they, they weren't just saying, well, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, you can all go draft your own charters. They were saying, no, anybody that was subject to England now can now go draft their own charter and become whatever they want to be. I mean, it didn't mean just the government of Canada at the time. It meant all of us. Because if we're not bound to any of that shit no more, then how could we possibly be bound to Canada? That's who created it. We're, we basically made us all free instantly, period, from a sovereign standpoint. Then we just never claimed it. Didn't claim nothing. Then we turned around and contracted with the government of Canada. You had your hand up again. Did you just <coughs> mention earlier that the Charter of Rights and Freedoms was actually created in the UK? Yeah. Called the Canada Act or something? Yeah, Canada so Act 1982. If the UK dismissed us or, or let us go or cut our ties, how could they create our charter? Because Canada is a creation of the UK. But we, but in 31, you just said that they 
They cut the ties. They didn't cut the ties. They gave us the op They gave people the option of doing it. They gave countries the option of doing it. I think they actually did it, but either way, it doesn't matter because what the again. I don't want to explain this properly and use the right words, and I know. Uh, just hang on, because it's, it's. I'm trying to make this non-convoluted. Canada, for lack of a better description, is still just a corporation that's chartered out of the UK. If they release their colonies, they're talking about the actual physical colonies, but then they just still have that ship in commerce that is out there for us to still contract with. Corporate Canada's head office is in Washington, D.C. Yeah. So I don't doubt their head office is there, but their charter is back in England. Their charter is back in the United States, too. Uh, there's, there, there's also, I mean, I've heard all the talk about there being uh, clearly a second Canada from uh, Trudeau uh, incorporated and registered it in Washington, D.C., and there's two Canadas and all this other stuff and everything else, and I, I put that all inside this circle. And I call it them. It's their bookkeeping process. I don't give a shit about them. Whatever they've done in there is in there. I care about me and or us. Okay, These are mutually exclusive events and our only tie is that their trustees are something very valuable to me and I just want what I'm entitled to. That's it. Any explanations about well yeah but this charter this and this papal bull and uh, the 1200s Pope uh, Benedict Arnold, I mean, I don't even know, who, you know, whatever, made a papal decree that he claimed all the souls, the lost souls on the, the oceans of divinity or whatever the hell it was. <laughs> Do I care? And what am I, I going to use that as a defense? And I don't give a shit about some moron in the Vatican 8,000 years ago that claimed our souls because we're lost sheep. Give me a break. What relevancy does that have? Anyways, I don't care about it. That's over here where all nonsense is. It's just, it's, who cares? Does that really mean that I, that the judge is coming back the third time in ecclesiastical court and because of a papal bull, they own my soul and that's what gives them jurisdiction over me? Are you kidding me? I'd love to see one of them actually say that. They're the one that should be getting a psych evaluation at that point. <laughs> Fucking, you're calling me crazy? Holy shit, man. Again, that's all over here. That's why I don't even normally get into those discussions about most of this other kind of stuff, right? What, and unless they can prove it to me, then I don't care. That comes down to, again, the whole, well, Mr. Clifford, it's my opinion that uh, the criminal code of matter still applies to you in this matter. I don't give a shit. I don't care about your opinion. Again, why, why, why does it apply? Because of the papal bull that was passed in the 8th century? Can, what can you prove to me? Prove it to me. Prove your claim to me. That's the only time I'm ever obligated to respond to something. It's when you prove your claim. So, that's my take on all that. That's why sometimes I don't even get into the whole, well, Canada this and everything else, and oh, they're really doing this, and other stuff I can't prove, and if, if I could prove it, what difference would it make? That's my, that's, I think that was, that's my second smell check, by the way. I have those few smell checks. The, the first ones is the extremes, and then the other one is, okay, Okay, let's follow this, this line of thinking. Um, I have to obey Canada because Canada is part of the New World Order, which is secretly controlled by a reptilian race that comes from the Pleiades galaxy, and they have motherships around our sun right now, and they're creating a new rainbow currency, and they're enslaving the, the human race through mind control. Like, oh, like, okay, that's the other smell check. Let's pretend that that is actually true. Okay, I'm just going to take your word for it. That's actually true. What could I do about that? <laughs> Am I going to build a starship and go to war with a reptilian race from the Pleiades galaxy? <laughs> yeah. I'd love to do it, yeah. Call, yeah. <laughs> Call me ambitionless. No. 
what I want to do is go home and have a fire at my house tonight and enjoy probably a Captain Morgan and some water. On my list of things to do is not building a starship in my garage to go to war with the reptilian race. So even if it is true, I don't care because there's nothing I can do about it. So I'm just going to live my life the way I see fit anyways until the reptilians show up and kill me. <laughs> We can negotiate treaties with them as sovereigns, yes. I have my letters going into the leader of the reptilian race. We're in negotiations. Okay, so that's my other smell check. Is it, even if this grand conspiracy were so true, all the way back to the Vatican and all these millions of unknowing agents are doing the work of Satan and everything else, okay, I, ju I can't do anything about that. I can't. So how can, so what does that matter? It doesn't matter. If it's something that is so far beyond my ability to do anything about it, then it doesn't matter. So that's my other smell test. Smell test. I have very very rigid smell tests, <laughs> where that leads me to smell bullshit. And that, again, if it's that, if if the conspiracy really is that deep, it, it, it's impossible for it to be. It's impossible. But on the chance it is, you, you're, you can't do anything about it. So just go ahead and live your life until they actually show up at your house and the reptilians eat you one night. <laughs> that is when it becomes your problem. <laughs> until then, it is not your problem. Because there's just nothing now. There's no more rule of law at all. So that they have to maintain the rule of law. They must. And the fear is real. So they're definitely yeah. afraid of something. Absolutely. But they're hiding the rule of law. That's all that's going on. The rule of law is still here. It never left. We did. That's like the down in the U.S., what do they call it? The, uh, the Republic. The house that no one lives in. It's still there. No one lives in it. It's empty. Everybody left and went off and became 14th Amendment citizens and gave up voluntarily absolutely everything they possibly could have been afforded by birthright. Any other questions? Just a little experience with a driver's license. A year ago, my friend was so busy bad-mouthing her neighbors in the trailer court that she forgot to buckle up. And of course, there is a <laughs> revenue collector making profit behind the corner. He stops us, he looks at me, I have a seat, but she does not, and she goes, cool. He comes to my car, my window, and he says, can I have your driver's license? And I looked at him and I said, do you know that it's not actually mine? It says that it's property of British Columbia. I just discovered it. Isn't that something? And you know, he just looks at me. Then he looks at my friend. He walks on her side and he says, can I have your driver's license? Yep, there you go. She's here 25 years and all she mustered to say, no driving. So he asks her for BCID she provides. So she gets the ticket. He comes back. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. He comes back to my side and he says, well, because she was pulled over while you were driving, can I see that BC ID so I need to identify what car she was stopped in? And I said, but you know, it's not my driver's license. Didn't say a word. <laughs> yep. So she got the ticket. Yeah, absolutely. The, uh, <coughs> until they get that, until they see that document, they know they have no jurisdiction. That's why they really make it tough on you to produce it. That's why I made it so that it's impossible for me to produce it. I don't have it. I can't be compelled to do the impossible. But oddly enough, last time I got pulled over and they took my truck and they charged me, I never even gave them my name at all. For four days I was in prison. That was a year and change ago. At all. I was just making a point. I, I do that sometimes. So when they let me go, they gave me a whole whack of charges with my name and the driver's license on it. It's like, I don't even possess that anymore. How do you just, everything they did was they just fabricated all the evidence against me completely. They can't even prove I gave them the license. So everything they did, so there's some pretty serious crimes there now. Do you have license plates on your car? Uh, the one I brought out here, yeah. Yeah, I'm not going to do a cross Canada trip with uh, stopping every other kilometer to, to fight a battle right now, so. Is that happening in Manitoba? Uh, like what, with, the, uh, with them harassing me still? Not really. There were some really interesting things surrounding that 18 days and when they finally let me out and uh... So now you can drive basically without a plate contract or whatever? Well, I always could. It's... Yeah. But there... It, you gotta remember, it's not like I, you know, well now you can? Well no, I always could. The problem is, is how far were they willing to go to 
to push me around and damage yeah, me and force compliance from me. Yeah, that's so it's it's now I think they're getting nervous enough that they're. And is there a difference? Uh, I'm hoping this is a redundant question because these things, so many other things probably pop in every day. Probably afraid to ask, but uh, why is it the Republic of Texas and the Republic of Manitoba are those not almost different types of governments in those jurisdictions? Um, the Republic recognizes the individual's inherent rights, so is or the rights of the individual, and we live in a democracy which is mob rule. Mm -hmm. Right, but, but yeah. Manitoba is a republic. I know nothing about that. No, we're no, it's it's it is monarchy. There's no, there's no That's correct. Yeah, no, you no. The I guarantee Manitoba is a republic. Okay. Yes, it is. Either way. And so is Texas. Yeah. I don't care what they are. Well, there could be a difference of why you're you're getting some of your freedom there. I'm sure there could be. It could be a different reptile in charge of them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. I'm making it. I mean, I'm I know. I know. I know that. I know. That's why I said I'm not trying to make funny. I'm just like, like honestly, okay. that that's the way I view everything, though. Like that's why I make jokes like that well, because it's it just. Cool, I'm just trying. It's trying to be yeah. a legitimate question. Yeah, I agree. But I just like I don't know. Like I don't know what they are. I I can't even tell you what I am. I certainly can't start telling you what the government of Manitoba is. I just don't know. Honestly, I've said that before. So really. That's where it comes down to the irrelevancy part, right? Like, like they're not going to tell me even if I ask them, and even if I am right, is it like, you, well, you guys well, can't do that. Never looked into that stuff. No, that's I, I did. I, I've done everything you guys are all doing. I looked into this stuff for years, and then I just finally realized one day, how could I possibly need to know all this just to be free? Mm -hmm. Clearly, I don't. That's when I started realizing something was wrong with it all, actually. And it was just that, me trying to figure out what everything else is, instead of just realizing, wait a minute, how would I just figure out what I am and just stop caring about what they are? And if they believe they can come and trespass, they're going to have to prove it now. It's not up to me to prove what they are, what they aren't, all that kind of stuff. So that was the point I'm trying to make with that. Right? So I don't, that's why I get into that. That's why I just have the two circles now, the mutually exclusive events. And that's why I'm actually trying to make people understand whether it's, by swearing or making jokes or getting angry and all the other stuff that I do just to make it stand out in people's minds. That's why I do that, by the way. You guys ever notice that things stand out in your mind more when, you know? So people have to, I still get caught up in it sometimes. I'm still like, oh man, I gotta go find out what that is. And then, oh no, wait a minute. No, actually I don't because I don't care. Until it becomes a problem for me. And then they have to prove it. Otherwise I'm just, dude, right here. And no one's supposed to be trespassing or do not trespass, whatever it says. No trespassing signs, all that kind of stuff. I mean, that's just an inherent right not to, you're told not to trespass. You shouldn't have to give people notice of that. So, um, what was Elsa gonna say about that? Because <sighs> I did look into Manitoba at one point in time. I got maps of Manitoba going back to when they were 60 square miles around Winnipeg. <laughs> and they just expanded, they grew. I got maps that show where uh, New Iceland is where um, Gimli is now. Uh, Gimli, it's all part of the province now, and it's uh, it's all it's they've overlapped. Every time they they do something new, they never get rid of the old. It's just overlapped over the old. That's why the BNA is still there, but they've buried it under what they call renaming it. Well, are they trespassing? Absolutely, they are. That's what I mean. They're trespassing, and they're the ones that have to prove up their claim. That's actually the point of all this. That's why I'm talking about is the same principle, pushing it all the way back. It's what a lot of people are interested in doing. Ron Paul talks about that in the United States. Yeah, um, you can't restore the Constitution. It never no. went anywhere. No, no, you can't. Yeah, so he doesn't. You have, to, you have to go right back and say what belongs to you, what does not belong to them, what, what doesn't belong to you. You know, you've got to straighten it all out somewhere. That's what everybody seems to be trying to do right now. Um, yeah, well, there's a lot of confusion, but uh, it's it, it's confused, but it's not. It's it's all still there. It's just you got to understand mm -hmm. who who you are, and then all the all the nonsense, the layers and layers and layers and layers and layers of deception they put over top of everything, just just go away at that point, because it's all their nonsense. Mm -hmm. It's all there to make us believe in their authority. Yeah. So instead of proving they don't have authority, all we have to do is say. Well, I don't have to prove that you have authority, that you don't have authority over me. I'm just going to say you don't. And now you have to prove you do. 
So you can provide all the horse shit you want, but you got to prove to me you got jurisdiction. Some of that don't, uh, don't thank me, thank yourselves. You people are actually taking the responsibility in your lives to do something for positive change in the face of all the shit that's out there and people calling us terrorists and make, trying to make us look really bad. So everybody here actually deserves the thanks for taking up, you know, putting up, taking up a stand for your life for once. Everything you guys want to do, you'll be able to do with just understanding the simple concept. And you have to get used to starting to write all this stuff by yourself and not relying on templates. I don't do templates because they know what templates are. You don't think they share this information behind the scenes? When you cut and paste stuff and you, you, you enter stuff and you can't explain? So word it yourself, word it simple and be just as genuine as possible in your document when you're printing it and using your own words. That's what jurisdiction is. I